the latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Greg Edwards. The Stansted Express isn't running between Harlow and Stansted Airport and no greater Anglia services between Bishop Stortford and the airport, also between Bishop Stortford and Cambridge. It's all because of overhead wire problems. GWR services are suspended between Newbury and Westbury because of flooding, although some long-distance trains may divert. On the roads in East Lothian, the westbound side of the A1 is still closed at Wallyford because of an accident. Also, there's flooding in the area. In London at Hackney, delays on the A12 East Cross route on the northbound side because of an accident between Hackneywick and Lee Interchange. The lane's still closed. In Devon, the A388 is closed at Holsworthy because of an accident. That's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. Nana Queer. Weekends from 3 p.m. I like to call this one robbing Peter to pay Paul. The Labour Party have embarked on a journey that I can only describe as politics of envy. I think it's time we scrutinise their policies more closely and establish in our minds what a Labour government might mean to the education system. Sir Keir Starmer and his party have for far too long capitalised on the abject failure of the Conservatives and haven't really had to explain themselves. But as part of their manifesto, Labour intend to charge VAT at 20% on private schools because I suspect they think that people who send their kids there will stump up the cash no matter what and that these people have money. They will then use this money, Labour, to fund state schools. Basically, they will rob Peter to pay Paul. But what I believe they've failed to realise, and I'm not sure whether they've factored this in, is that many people who send their kids to private schools do so at great sacrifice and are, in fact, paying twice into the education system. I spent my first year of secondary education in a state school. I'll be honest, when I started, I was at the top of the class. But by the end of the year, I was near the bottom. But then my dad got promoted to a post on Wall Street in the States. My parents sent me to a private boarding school in the UK run by nuns and my family moved to America. Thank God for the opportunity I was given to go private. At boarding school I grew in confidence and I'm here now because of it. My father's work, Nat West, and alone my dad took out paid for my private education. We were nowhere near as rich as some of the kids there, but... There are also many children, I would say at least half, whose parents were busting a gut to send them there. It is clear that the state education system is failing, but rather than robbing Peter to pay Paul, surely it would be better for the party to improve the state system without destroying the private sector. Good morning to you and a blessed good Friday. It's 9.30 on Friday, March 29th. This is Britain's Newsroom with me, Ben Leo, and Don Neeson. Honours for the boys. Rishi Sunak sparks an honours row after awarding a gong to a top Tory donor. The chair of the Labour Party, Annalise Dodds, gave her reaction earlier. Of, of astonishment. You know, you either uh, would feel that perhaps Rishi Sunak is so arrogant that he doesn't mind any more of what the public think, or perhaps he's demob happy, he believes that he's on the way out. If anything, it demonstrates yet again his weakness. Also going under, levelling up Secretary Michael Gove has blasted the water company after bosses asked to raise bills by a staggering 40% to avoid nationalisation. The answer is for the management team to look to their own approach and ask themselves why they're in this difficult situation. And of course the answer is because of serial mismanagement for which they must carry the can. And tired Tories, Dame Andrea Leadsom says so. Many Conservative MPs are quitting their job because they're exhausted. Let's have a listen. Your sort of your lifespan as an MP is significantly shorter than it used to be. And the reason for that is, of course, the pressures of the job and, of course, the hostility of social media, the death threats, the, you know, people genuinely find it exhausting. Madness in Milton Keynes. A Section 34 dispersal order is in place after a large gang fight and antisocial behaviour involving around 300 children and teenagers. The UK is nearly double to double aid for Sudan to help their humanitarian crisis. But could that 89 million be spent better in Britain? We'll debate that soon.
And of course, let us know your views and all those stories, gbviews at gbnews.com. And thank you, by the way, so much for joining us on Bank Holiday Weekend. It's Good Friday today. Are you religious, Dawn? What's your, your vibe? I'm getting more religious by the minute at the moment, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. No, um, it's, it's Good Friday, so um, just happy Easter, everybody. And thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and also, by the way, we've got an exclusive with Philip Davies, MP, who has just been knighted by Rishi Sunak. I'm going to ask him if it's just honours for the boys or is it well deserved? Yes. All that and more. First, though, your news headlines with Sophia. Thanks, Ben. Good morning. It's 9.33. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB Newsroom. Your headlines. A 19-year-old man has been charged with attempted murder and possession of an offensive weapon after a stabbing on a train on Wednesday. Rakeem Thomas has been remanded into custody. He will appear at Wimbledon Magistrates Court. It's after an incident between Beckenham Junction and Shortlands train stations. The alleged victim, who is in his 20s, was taken to hospital, where police earlier said he was in a critical but stable condition. One of the Conservative Party's major donors has received a knighthood as part of a surprise honours list from Rishi Sunak. Mohammed Mansour gave £5 million to the Tories last year and is a senior treasurer for the party. He was knighted for what's described as services to business, charity and politics. The timing of the list is unusual, coming while Parliament is in recess and on the eve of the Easter Bank holiday weekend. Documents have revealed that the post office was aware of errors in its IT horizon system, despite bosses proceeding with prosecutions. More than 900 sub-postmasters were wrongly prosecuted due to supposed losses flagged by a faulty computer system. A draft report carried out by Deloitte was commissioned by the post office in 2016. It shows that top managers knew that financial discrepancies may not be the fault of sub-postmasters. A spokesperson for the post office says it remains fully focused on supporting the inquiry. And we're in for a blustery Easter weekend with strong winds and even some flood warnings in place. Ferry operators are warning of possible disruption with strong winds making for a choppy journey across the channel. A yellow warning is in place across large parts of England throughout the day. And the RAC is warning motorists to take care on the roads with around 14 million cars expected over the holiday. And for the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Dawn and Ben. Good morning to you and happy Good Friday and to you, Dawn. And to you, indeed, and to this, everyone out there. This Easter celebration. Um, it feels like we're not allowed to say that anymore, isn't it, with the, the litany of anti-Christian well, you know heading our way. I'm not even sure whether you meant to say Happy Easter on Good Friday. I'm not sure you meant to say Happy Easter until the Sunday, maybe? But like Christmas, isn't Easter a, a festival? It's Lent, yes, isn't it, from the start yeah, of the Yeah, but I mean... Oh, ha well, look, do, happy re Good Friday? Regard regardless of the semantics, Dawn, I love Easter. I have a, I always say I'm not religious, but I have an affinity with Jesus. So happy Easter to you. Oh, thank you very much. Love you, Dawn. Oh, thank you. Right, just talk amongst yourselves. I'm just going to carry on eating this. You won't. You won't uh, need to do an Ed Miliband and eat it on air. I'll no, let you no, off. no, no, no. I you won't do that because that never looks good eating on air. We can share it, though, can't we, Ben? Yeah. Definitely, yes, in exactly. the break. Yes. Right, let's crack on with today's show. It's action-packed. Uh, we're going to kick off with Conservative MPs who seem to be quitting, I don't know if you've noticed, in their droves in the run-up to the general election. Have you ever wondered why? Well, here is Dame Andrea Ledsom speaking to our political editor, Christopher Hope, on his latest podcast about just this. Let's have a listen. I mean, I, I think those standing down this time, it is a function for many people of their time in office. You know, we've already seen statistically... Your, your sort of your lifespan as an MP is significantly shorter than it used to be. And the reason for that is, of course, the pressures of the job and, of course, the hostility of social media, the death threats, the, you know, people genuinely find it exhausting. I find it exhausting. I mean, I, even as a, you know, sunlit uplands person as I am, yes. I wake up some days and think, oh, really? Yeah, daily, daily threats to you? I mean... Well, yes. I mean, not, not, not you daily. know, not sort of daily threats, but I, I've had death threats. I've had paper death threats with, you know, we know where you live sort of thing. I've had people spitting at me outside Parliament. It's pretty revolting. All right, so joining us now is Paul Scully. He's been the Tory MP for Sutton and Cheam since 2015, but he'll be stepping down at the next general election. Good morning to you, Good morning Paul. To you, ben. Can I just ask, I'll be frank, some people are saying that it's, uh, no offence, rats fleeing a sinking ship. Is that the case? 
Uh, look, not for me. I'll just a brief history of my, my reasons. I um, thought, you know, I'm pretty sure I would win my seat. It would be a struggle, but win my seat in the next election. It's the next five years. I never want to retire as an MP uh, in my 80s shuffling around a place. So if I'm not going to be around to be the sort of like part of the long-term solution for the party, better leave it to someone else to do. Other people, though, will be leaving because of what I, the, the reasons that Andrea said. Some people will be fearful of their seats and then uh, losing their seats and then worrying about what job they're going to get uh, because they'll be in a, uh, uh, with, you know, with a, uh, you know, many other ex-MPs trying to find uh, is fishing for the same sort of jobs. For mine, mine was a sort of like longer process than that. So, I mean, you also mentioned, or, um, or Andrea mentioned, that MPs are worried about their safety, and that's one of the reasons that they're tired and why they're leaving in their droves. But some of the rhetoric you've used yourself, Paul, I mean, Tower Hamlets in London being a no-go area. I mean, how worried about you, uh, your personal safety as an MP? Is that one of the reasons maybe you consider stepping down? Not really, no, I, it wasn't actually. I'd already um, said to my association, funny enough, the weekend, that weekend before, it's a Monday morning that I said that, and the weekend before I told my association I wasn't going to be standing. Uh, I think it just confirmed that I made the right decision because what I was talking about is people feeling uncomfortable going to some areas. You then get shut down because, it, my bad, I chose um, particular words that trigger some people, confect some anger for some people, and it shuts down the discussion. You can't have those kind of discussions because everything is rosy. Then you're never going to get anything sorted. So it sort of confirmed the, the right decision for me. But the frenzy that I had was nothing compared to female MPs, to black MPs, to Asian heritage MPs, etc., who get that day in, day out. Paul, why did you apologise for that comment? Because I, I accept and I understand that swathes of our viewers would consider not necessarily about Tower Hamlets, but certain parts of the UK for that statement where it was a no-go area, you referred to Tower Hamlet says, as true. So why did you apologise? Because it distracted from what I was actually trying to say. What I was trying to say, not a no-go area, which some people interpreted as a, as a you can't go in there, the police can't go in there, etc. Right. What I was saying is that people, some people, feel uncomfortable going into areas. It might be white people going into black areas. It might be um, gay people, Jewish people going into um, areas where they've got... Uh, uh, some of the more extreme elements of of, of, um, of um, Islam in there, uh, like the the old um, Muslim patrols that were there a few years ago. It may be just older people going to past schoolboys that feel intimidated. Got it. It's that discomfort that we've got to tackle because otherwise, the, all the that what that does that just releases the um, a, sort of a space for people to start talking about being anti-Islam, to start talking about being racist and those kind of things. That's what I was trying to get across. Paul, the other story we need to talk to you about is uh, um, the gongs. Uh, is it just um, cronies being rewarded? No, I don't particularly know Mohammed Mansour, so I don't really, um, you know, I, I know that he was don uh, a donor to the party. I, I don't really know his wider work, but it's obviously um, it's charity work and business work as well as political. But I think if you look at Philip, um, Sir Philip now, if you look at Mark Spencer, you look at Tracy Crouch and, uh, and Harriet Baldwin, they've all done a lot of work um, from the back benches, from the select committees. Obviously, Mark Spencer was a chief whip as well in really, really difficult times. So they've earned their spurs there, those political services. Uh, someone like Philip has been on the former side of many, many governments, uh, and, but for a really constructive way that he's actually um, conducted himself um, at, at being, that, being that person. OK, Paul, and just finally, what do you make of this Thames Water fiasco? They're asking uh, to hike customer bills by about 40%, whilst, you know, drastically underperforming. Do we need to renationalise our uh, water companies? I don't think you can really nationalise water companies as a whole because I think you know that is going to be hugely expensive and it's going to detract away from uh, attracting the investment that we need to uh, plug the gaps and to uh, tackle the sewage issues that we, that we have. Something like the Times, uh, uh, the Thames Tideway Tunnel is taking something like nine years. It's a massive engineering project, but the problem with Thames Water is that it's just leveraged itself up with debt so many years, and a few years ago, it's still playing catch up rather than plugging those leaks, rather than stopping the sewage come in. Uh, and that we've got to really hold them to account on. Yeah, I mean, they, they don't do themselves any favours. I live uh, by the coast in Sussex, and I say every day on this show that the water company down there, Southern Water, continually pumping raw sewage into the sea. And just to be quite frank, it's vile.
It is. Look, but you, the problem is you can't do, and you're absolutely right about that, but you can't tackle it overnight. And unfortunately, there's only two ways sewage can go if you can't treat it. It either goes into that water or it comes back up where it came from. And so, uh, you know, for those people that say stop doing it, be careful of what you want because it's going to come the other way. But let's make sure we can hold those companies to account to actually not pay dividends out, to, but, but actually get the work done that needs to be done. And that's what we've been bringing in to um, over the last few years. So we're actually inspecting our water far better than we, than we used to. So we are actually far more aware of this than we ever were before Brexit. Paul, you say you're more aware of it and you can't stop it overnight. I mean, briefly, we're running out of time. But, I mean, you have... Ha I mean, this has been going on for years now. The water company has been paying themselves millions, billions of pounds in bonuses to shareholders. I mean, what is what is the government doing? What's off what been doing? They seem absolutely useless. No, they're, look, they're regulated. Absolutely needs to be tackled. But you say it's been going on for years. To a bit 2010, when we first came in as the coalition government, we were testing something like 10 percent of the things that we're testing for. Now we're up to about 95 percent of testing. So we can actually test for more things. It's not just sewage. Uh, there's a lot more pollutants in the water that we are actually discovering and that we're tackling the water companies on. But the regulator has been pretty ineffectual over, the, over that time. So, yes, that's why we've brought in legislation to really tighten that up. But again, as I say, if you look at the Thames issue, it's a huge, huge engineering job that's having to be done to replace all those Victorian sewers. You know, these are things that are 150 years old that we're trying to replace. Yeah. OK, Paul, uh, one last question for you. Um, Danny Kruger, your colleague, he said that the criticisms of the Conservative Party from Reform UK are, quote, mostly valid in a leaked recording. And he said, uh, we're not a very Conservative Party in lots of ways. What do you think of that? Do you agree? Uh, I think this, this, we should always be criticised as a party. We've got to renew ourselves. And, uh, but in terms of where he is, he's on a different side of the Conservative Party to many others as well. So we're a broad church. What we've got to do after the election... We need a, a, a strong, manageable uh, party that can be led to redefine what we mean as Conservatives so we can actually sell a vision to the country. If we don't know what we're talking about in terms of that vision, then how do we expect the public to know that? Yeah, I mean, some would argue the fact you are a so-called broad church is precisely the problem. But, uh, Paul, I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you so much. And also, good luck with your future endeavours post-politics, whatever you choose to get up to. What are you uh, uh, imagining for the future? Have you got plans? No, I've got. Uh, well, this is the thing now. I've got to look for a job, Ben. So I've, uh, I've got one small job, but it ain't going to pay the bills yet. So I've got plenty of work to be doing alongside my day job. I'm still an MP for the next few months, so I've still got to represent Sutton, Cheam, and Worcester Park. All right, good man. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate it. Have a Thank good weekend. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Cheers. Right. Uh, in response, Thames Water have said uh, we'd like to reassure our customers that despite this announcement, it is business as usual for Thames Water. Our 8,000 staff remain committed to working with our partners in the supply chain to provide our services for the benefit of our customers, communities and the environment. Mm, OK, right. Tonight at 9pm, Patrick Christie speaks to the former Immigration Minister, Robert Jenrick. You don't want to miss this. Take a listen. Well, I didn't feel that the Prime Minister understood the importance of legal migration to the British public. It was an issue that I have cared about for a long time. I shared that conviction with Suella Braverman, the, the Home Secretary at the time. She and I met the Prime Minister approximately every fortnight to talk about Home Office issues, like stopping the boats, like security and policing. Never once did we have a conversation about legal migration because the Prime Minister didn't want to talk about it. Mm, interesting. You don't want to watch it. What, miss that one, do you? Right, up next, we're sending 89 million to Sudan to help with their humanitarian crisis. Should some or maybe all of that money be spent here in the UK instead? This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Is the brand of toothpaste super important here, or is it more about the toothbrush, because I was told a long time ago by my dentist, electric toothbrush, Pip, that is the way to go. You're exactly right. I mean, the action of mechanically removing plaque, so using a brush, is much more effective than the brand of toothpaste itself. But in terms of the ingredient in toothpaste that we're looking for, it's something called fluoride. And fluoride is essential to help remineralize and strengthen our teeth. It's really important to use a toothpaste with fluoride. And in terms of brushing, 
using an electric toothbrush is just much easier. You know, you're brushing your teeth first thing in the morning, last thing at night. You're going to be a bit tired in those times. So using an electric toothbrush, you just hold it against your tooth and gum and it does all the work for you. So it's just much easier in my opinion. But you have to use your electric toothbrush properly. You're exactly right, yeah. There is a technique of actually brushing your teeth, although it sounds really simple. With an electric toothbrush, you have to hold it against the tooth and the gum. Ideally, you want a pressure sensor in that toothbrush so you know exactly when you're pressing too hard. But if you're using a manual toothbrush, you need to move it around and small circular motions. But actually, what I see is people who use manual toothbrushes, they tend to over-scrub and over-brush, which can actually lead to gum recession and your enamel thinning long term. Sometimes I will get up in the morning and I will have breakfast and then I'll brush my teeth. Is that wrong? <laughs> Unfortunately, that's wrong. So the best time to brush your teeth is first thing in the morning as soon as you wake up. If you're brushing after you eat and after breakfast, you're brushing your teeth in that weakened, acidic state. So your teeth are actually under attack and they're much more vulnerable. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. 9.50 a.m. Ben and Dawn on Britain's newsroom, only on GB News. Now, the UK government has pledged to almost double its support for Sudan to £89 million. Pounds. OK. It's to help the nation cope with a humanitarian crisis that was sparked by a year-long war. But should we abolish foreign aid and spend the money here in Britain? Joining us now is political commentator... Femi Nylander. Good morning to you, Femi. Thanks for joining us. So, £89 million to Sudan. First question, is that enough? Is it generous? Is it too much? Second of all, the wider foreign aid budget. We're sending, for example, £8.5 million to China, or we did so last year, all while, by the way, they're building bases on the moon. Is that right? So, um, when we talk about foreign aid, I would encourage everyone at to go to you. Adjacent people pay. What we need to remember, of course, is that um, this is in many ways a smokescreen. So countries like the UK, countries like France, what they do is they give a couple of peanuts, a bit of aid to, to the, the so-called developing world while, with their right hand, whilst with the left hand, through um, the tax evasion of large multinational companies, through, uh, through trade mispricing, um, through unfair global trade rules by organizations such as the World Trade Organization, which say you need to have free trade in the developing world. Like the EU, for example, can have subsidies, um, farmer subsidies. That's a big thing in the news at the moment, the idea that farmers want their subsidies. But we tell poor countries they have to have free trade, they can't have subsidies. But trillions and trillions of pounds flow from poor countries to rich countries every year. And then a little bit of it gives, gets given back in aid. And this is the reality of the situation, which anyone can see if they do a bit of research, go to YouTube, that type in Jason. And so it's almost like the bully in the playground takes everyone's pocket money. Um, gives everyone 10p back to buy some Freddos, or I mean, with inflation, Freddos are a bit more than 10p now. When I was a kid, they were 10p, and then complains about having to give them a little bit back. Hang on, Femi, what, what do you mean we're taking people's pocket money? What do you mean by that? What I mean is that the UK, large multinational UK companies which work, I mean, so the UK, apart from like large bombs which blow off Palestinian kids' legs, what do we actually produce? We got our main our main export is weapons. We don't, as a country, produce very much. We produce some services, but we don't produce very much. So where does our wealth come from? Well, the reality is, as I say, if you do the research and if you look into it, the reality is a lot of the UK's wealth comes from 
other countries. It comes from large British multinationals well, that work in other countries that avoid taxing those countries. Where does any other nation get their, their money from? What are, you, what are you talking about? Where does any other country get their nation from when it comes to exports, their, their wealth from? Well, I mean, a lot of countries. So there's a difference between countries which have trade surpluses and trade deficits. Countries which have trade surpluses are countries that export more than they import, and therefore they get their wealth from exporting goods. The UK has a massive trade deficit. It doesn't get its wealth from exporting goods. It with imports a, a trade goods. everything we have is made in China. A trade deficit in general. A trade deficit in economics is when you import. Sorry, is when you yeah, is when you import more than you export with the world at large. That's what in economics trade deficit means. So if the UK imports more than it exports, it has a trade deficit. It doesn't produce very much goods. It produces weapons, but other than that, it doesn't like... We, Margaret Thatcher destroyed all the industries in the UK. Right, anyway, so, we import so, so, a lot of things so you're and saying, we, don't, we don't... You're saying our £13 billion aid budget that we give to other countries quite generously isn't enough, it's peanuts? I'm saying that the UK extracts wealth from other countries all over the world. Which, Who does as, as I say, please... Most countries, most countries aren't the sick rich. Most, like, can you tell me how a country like the Seychelles or a country like the Congo extracts wealth from other countries? They don't. Are you, are you saying international trade system. is a bad thing? I, I, I don't quite get what you're I'm saying. saying. I'm saying that the. I'm saying. Sorry, uh, I'll, I'll try and explain in, in simpler terms. Um, I'm saying that Please. the international trade system that we live in is still unfair and is still predicated upon the rules that international trade had to go through in the colonial time. I'm saying that large multinational companies okay, that it. work in places like Bangladesh and use sweatshops, okay, um, large so multinational chocolate companies that, 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 that force kids to work, use child labour to provide us with our Mars. Femi, so, sorry All to interject this, and uh, to interrupt you. We've got to go through a break, but appreciate you coming on. Thanks for, for the points. Thank you. Uh, two hours left coming up, still to come. Do we really want bearded squaddies? Find out why that will soon be a reality. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News, the People's Channel. Alex Deakin has your weather. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Morning. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office. The Easter weekend is here and the weather looks like slowly turning a little drier and a little warmer, with many of us likely to have a fine day on Sunday. Yeah, far from fine out there today, although some of us starting off with a bit of sunshine, but showers already in some places and the showers just get going more widely from late morning through into the early afternoon. Heavy, even thundery showers zipping through on a fairly brisk breeze, so it won't rain all day, but when the showers come along, hail, thunder is also possible. Temperatures maybe just sneaking up a bit compared to yesterday, but still feeling cool when the showers hit and because of that brisk wind. That will continue to blow showers across the UK through this evening and uh, overnight they should tend to fade in many locations uh, but we'll keep some going across the west coast of uh, Wales, southwest England and some continuing to push into parts of Scotland also but many central and eastern parts of England turning dry and clear. Pretty chilly as well, temperatures well down into single digits to start Saturday. But we should start with a bit of sunshine on Saturday. Tomorrow morning, fine over the Midlands and eastern England in particular. And generally, although there will still be showers around tomorrow, not as many as today. A better chance that most of tomorrow will be dry and bright, particularly across parts of southern England. Could see some more rain returning to the southwest later on. But a bit more in the way of sunshine, feeling a bit warmer. And for many of us, Sunday looks decent too. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Greg Edwards. On the trains, no Stansted Express services operating between Stansted Airport and Harlow Town, and there are no Greater Anglia services between Stansted Airport and Bishop Stortford, also between Bishop Stortford and Cambridge. It's all because of overhead wire problems. Meanwhile, GWR services are suspended between Newbury and Westbury because of flooding, although some long-distance trains may divert. Scott Rail services are currently at a stand between Belgrove and Blair Hill after a road vehicle hit a railway bridge. In East Lothian, the A1 is still closed westbound for recovery of an accident. Delays in the area with flooding not helping the situation. And in Hertfordshire, the A1M is closed northbound between Junction 6 at Wellin and 7 at Stevenage South for roadworks. That's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. Want to be a winner just like Phil? Obviously, whoever wins it next is going to be 
as happy as I was. And they're going to get even more money this time round, so why wouldn't you go in the draw? Enter our massive spring giveaway. There's £12,345 in tax-free cash to give your finances a spring boost. We'll also send you on a shopping spree with £500 worth of vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. You'll also get a garden gadget package. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good morning, it's 10am on Friday the 29th of March. This is Marisa Newsroom on GB News with Ben Leo and Meadon Nissan. Good morning to you and a blessed good Friday. Honours for the boys. Rishi Sunak sparks an honours row after awarding a gong to a top Tory donor. The Labour Party, meanwhile, their chair, Annalise Dodds, gave her reaction earlier. Of, of astonishment, you know, you either uh, would feel that perhaps Rishi Sunak is so arrogant that he doesn't mind any more of what the public think, or perhaps he's demob happy, he believes that he's on the way out. If anything, it demonstrates yet again his weakness. And Thames Water going under, levelling up Secretary Michael Gove has blasted the water company after bosses asked to raise bills by 40% to avoid nationalisation. The answer is for the management team to look to their own approach and ask themselves why they're in this difficult situation. And of course the answer is because of serial mismanagement for which they must carry the can. And madness in Milton Keynes. A Section 34 dispersal order is in place after a large gang fight and antisocial behaviour involving around 300 children and teenagers. Easter travel warning, millions of us will be impacted by chaos on the roads, rails and ferries today. Let us know how you have been affected. As always, let us know your thoughts on all the topics we're discussing today. Not least, the inbox is going wild, Dawn, about foreign aid. £89 million to Sudan in the wake of their war effort. Also, though, last year we sent £8.5 million to China, mm. who are building a base on the moon. Yes, well, I mean, they need a bit of help with it, obviously. <laughs> Meanwhile, we're all struggling with our bills, aren't we? Yeah, and also, let us know what you're up to this Easter weekend. Uh, is it an important time for you? Do you care about Easter? I'm not particularly religious, but we have a tradition in our household where we have a lovely uh, Easter Sunday breakfast with boiled eggs and croissants It's lovely. And it's, it's just a nice time of the year to spend time with family. So I hope you're having a lovely good Friday out there with those you love as well. Right, all that and more before your news with Sophia Wensler. Thanks, Ben. Good morning. It's two minutes past ten. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB Newsroom. Your top story this hour, one of the Conservative Party's major donors has received a knighthood as part of a surprise honours list from Rishi Sunak. Mohammed Mansour gave £5 million to the Tories last year and is a senior treasurer for the party. He was knighted for what's described as services to business, charity and politics. Other recipients include MPs Philip Davies and Esther McVeigh, who are also former presenters on this network. 
The timing of the list is unusual, coming while Parliament is in recess and on the eve of the Easter Bank holiday weekend. Labour Party chairwoman Annalise Dodds says it's the act of a Prime Minister who doesn't expect to have his job much longer. I think I probably had the same response as many members of the public, a response of, of astonishment. You know, you either uh, would feel that perhaps Rishi Sunak is so arrogant that he doesn't mind any more of what the public think, or perhaps he's demob happy, he believes that he's on the way out. Either way, I think there's a huge amount of concern about the fact that there seems to be an almost automatic pass now under the Conservatives, and particularly the individual, uh, Mr Mansour, who was last year, last January, the biggest ever donor to the Conservatives, £5 million at that stage, the biggest individual donation that had been given, then seeming to have that automatic pass through to receiving uh, uh, an honour under Rishi Sunak. I think, if anything, it demonstrates yet again his weakness, that he's focused on internal party issues all of the time, rather than on the needs of our country. Clearly, there's a big Conservative problem here. We've got to clean up politics. That's why Labour said we'd have an independent integrity and ethics commission. And I think Documents have revealed that the post office was aware of errors in its Horizon IT system, despite bosses proceeding with prosecutions. More than 900 sub-postmasters were wrongly prosecuted due to supposed losses flagged by a faulty computer system. A draft report carried out by Deloitte was commissioned by the post office in 2016. It shows that top managers knew that financial discrepancies may not be the fault of sub-postmasters, but continued to fight them in court regardless. A spokesperson for the post office says it remains fully focused on supporting the inquiry. A 19-year-old man has been charged with attempted murder and possession of an offensive weapon after a stabbing on a train on Wednesday. Rakeem Thomas has been remanded into custody. He will appear at Wimbledon Magistrates Court. It's after an incident between Beckenham Junction and Shortlands train stations. The alleged victim, who's in his 20s, was taken to hospital, where police earlier said he was in a critical but stable condition. The task of clearing Baltimore's port will take some considerable time after President Biden committed $60 million to rebuilding the collapsed bridge. It's after a cargo ship crashed into one of the key bridge's foundations on Tuesday. It remains in the port and the measures about as long as the Eiffel Tower. Speaking yesterday, Maryland's governor, Wes Moore, said they face an incredibly complex job to reopen the port. This work will not take hours. This work will not take days. This work will not just take weeks. We have a very long road ahead of us. To the people of this state, I say we are going to get through this because we are Maryland tough and we are Baltimore strong. And we're in for a blustery Easter weekend with strong winds and even some flood warnings in place. Ferry operators are warning of possible disruption with strong winds making for a choppy journey across the channel. A yellow warning is in place across large parts of England throughout today. And the RAC is warning motorists to take care on the roads, with around 14 million car trips expected over the holiday. And for the latest story, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Welcome back. It's at six minutes past ten exactly. Not that you care because it's Good Friday. <laughs> uh, this is Britain's Newsroom on GB News with Ben Leo and Meadow Neeson. Should we get stuck into some emails? Yeah. Uh, Julia has quite helpfully, good morning Julia, answered my question from the top of the show about when Easter starts. Uh, she says Easter isn't official until Easter Sunday or late Saturday night as we are then celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. Good Friday is the day of the crucifixion when Christ died at 3pm. So Good Friday is more sombre. It is, and we should actually be thinking about that as well. So if you are celebrating Easter, then, you have know, thoughts with you all. Um, now, uh, also, Andrea Leadsom and exhausted Tory MPs. Andrea Leadsom said that MPs are tired. Maybe the population are tired of MPs not taking action when it's needed and not fulfilling their election promises. Well, there's a thought. Get yeah, them to do their jobs. There's an argument there that manifesto pledges should be made uh, law, and if you break them, then, you know, you come on... Um, 
you come into some trouble. Ben, our prisons are full already. With, yeah. There's not <laughs> enough room to bang them all up, unfortunately. <laughs> um, uh, on Philip Davies, who's just been given a gong. He's been knighted by Rishi Sunak. Margaret says, I like Philip Davies, but what has he done to deserve a knighthood, apart from being steadfast in his support of Rishi Sunak? Well, Philip's on the show a bit later on, just past 11 o'clock, so stick with us. I will be asking him just that. Yes, indeed. Be interesting. Right, now, the Prime Minister has sparked an Easter honours row, as we've just been discover discussing, as he's announced knighthood for a major Conservative Party donor. Egyptian-born billionaire Mohammed Mansour donated £5 million to the Tories last year. On breakfast this morning, Stephen and Ellie asked the Labour Party chair, Annalise Dodds, about what she thought about the honours system. Well, it had the same response as many members of the public, a response of, of astonishment, you know, you either uh, would feel that perhaps Rishi Sunak is so arrogant that he doesn't mind any more what the public think, or perhaps he's demob happy, he believes that he's on the way out. Either way, I think there's a huge amount of concern about the fact that there seems to be an almost automatic pass now under the Conservatives, and particularly the individual, uh, Mr Mansour, who was last year, last January, the biggest ever donor to the Conservatives, £5 million at that stage, the biggest individual donation that had been given, then seeming to have that automatic pass through to receiving uh, uh, an honour under Rishi Sunak. I think, if anything, it demonstrates yet again his weakness, that he's focused on internal party issues all of the time, rather than on the needs of our country. Clearly, there's a big Conservative problem here. We've got to clean up politics. That's why Labour said we'd have an independent integrity and ethics commission. And I think the public looking at this is really fed up. Joining us now is our political correspondent, Catherine Forster. Good morning, Catherine. I mean, look, I, I'm struggling to get angry about this because both parties, Labour and the Tories, have been doing this for years, exactly, haven't they? What's yeah. new about it? Well, yes, sure. We had uh, the cash for honours scandal under Labour uh, back in the noughties, so nothing new about this. But it is one of the reasons, isn't it, why so many people are really fed up with politicians, think they're all the same. Uh, a lot of people uh, think that the whole system is rotten because this honours list, and it's unusual to have uh, an honours list at this time of year. Mm. We'll come back to that in a second. But, you know, all the other people that have uh, been given awards, reasonably uncontroversial, Mark Spencer, farming minister, Philip Davies, big supporter of Rishi Sunak, Christopher Nolan, of course, the film director, too. But all the heat is around uh, Mohammed uh, Mansour because of this five million pounds. Now, that's a lot of money by any measure. And he was the biggest donor to the Conservative Party right up until Frank Hester, who came along and gave them £10 million. Uh -huh. And of course, there was an almighty row about him just a couple of weeks ago over the comments he'd made about Diane Abbott. The Conservative Party keeping tight hold of that money, despite calls to give it back. Of course, they've got a general election campaign to fund, but also the timing of this has reignited speculation about when the general election might be. We're fresh from hearing it's not going to be May. The government's still saying it's working on the assumption that it will be in the autumn. Most likely dates seem to be November the 14th or 21st, a week or two after the American election on November the 5th. But the timing of this is making some say well, if things go badly in the local elections, which we pretty much know they will for the Conservatives, uh, they might call a snap election in June or July. And this might be one of the things they're thinking about with the timing of this awards list coming right now. Catherine, why else would they would they announce this now? Because it was snuck out literally just before the Easter break, before everyone goes away for four days. So why, why else would they do it if it wasn't sending some kind of signal about the election? Well, yes, you would wonder. And what it has done is generated more bad headlines for the Prime Minister at a time that he's been really under fire um, from people across the political spectrum and, indeed, many people within his own party. Uh, a number of letters have gone in... Um, Plenty of uh, Conservative MPs now openly toying with the idea of getting rid of him. One reason, perhaps, is the need to get Vaughan Gething, the new First Minister of Wales, also um, 
Stephen Flynn, the leader of the SNP in Westminster, on to the Privy Council. So that's that's an official reason that we're being given. But, uh, yeah, I mean, they could have waited if they wanted to. So it's interesting and uh, just more bad headlines for the Prime Minister at a time that he really doesn't need them. But it he, does seem to be a self-inflicted. He really doesn't need them, does he? The other headline today was that Conservatives are being overtaken by Reform UK, especially among working-class voters. So why are they not understanding what the working-class voters, the Red Wall, are telling them? Why are they messing around with this, this cronies and this honours business when they should be concentrating on actually winning the election, maybe? Well, a very good question. And talking of reform, Richard Tice has joined the criticism of this. He said that it's obscene cronyism. Mm. He says the whole thing stinks like a rotting fish <laughs> from the head. And, of course, what we're seeing is reform going up and up in the polls, the Tories going down and down, only a few percentage points between them. And we've heard Danny Kruger of the New Conservatives, one of the right of the party, uh, recorded at a meeting last week saying they're really terrified of what reform are going to do to them, you know, that it could be disastrous because it's looking like many people who might have voted Conservative before are now thinking either they'll stay at home or they'll vote mm. for Reform, who they believe have got Conservative policies. Um, I think some of uh, Reform's policies in terms of the things they're promising, um, difficult to see perhaps how they would deliver them. But of course, it's not going to happen, is it? Because they might get millions of votes, as UKIP did back in 2015, uh, but they're unlikely to get many uh, seats. But what they could do is uh, mean that the Conservatives lose a lot of seats that they might otherwise have held on to. Yeah. And then, do you know what, Catherine? I think that's their aim. Everyone points back to UKIP in 2015, was it, where they won four and a half million votes, only got one seat. I've spoken to people at Reform, and actually I think the consensus is they don't really care that much about seats. The end goal is to just annihilate the Conservative Party, who they feel have completely lost any aspect of conservatism. Um, but I'll leave you to it, Catherine. Thank you for your time. We'll be speaking to you a bit later on. And who best to uh, discuss a lot of our problems in the country, including the small boats crisis and the legal migration crisis, if you would call that, a city the size of Birmingham every two years, than the former immigration minister. Tonight, at 9pm, Patrick Christie's is going to speak to Robert Jenrick. Take a listen to this. Well, I didn't feel that the Prime Minister understood the importance of legal migration to the British public. It was an issue that I have cared about for a long time. I shared that conviction with Suella Braverman, the, the Home Secretary at the time. She and I met the Prime Minister approximately every fortnight to talk about Home Office issues, like stopping the boats, like security and policing. Never once did we have a conversation about legal migration because the Prime Minister didn't want to talk about it. That's Patrick Christie tonight at 9pm. You don't want to miss it. Now, up next, have you seen this footage from Milton Keynes? A Section 34 dispersal is in place after a large gang fight, including around 300 children and teenagers. We'll be discussing this next. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News. Don't go too far. Patrick Christie's Tonight, weekdays from 9pm. Has the NHS killed your relative and then lied to you about it? There is an alleged cover-up culture in the NHS. They lie to you about why your loved one died, about poor care, then bury documents with evidence in them, and they try to silence staff who speak out. This is according to the NHS Ombudsman. There are around 11,000 avoidable deaths every year. 11,000! Someone's mum dies, their children know something dodgy happened, and then they're met with a rotten culture, including the altering of care plans, the disappearance of crucial documents, and complete denials. They lie to you, but they really get away with it because the NHS is like a religion, and people dare not criticise it. You'd be accused of NHSophobia. That annual budget is around £180 billion, and we now have about 2 million people working for the NHS. They cannot keep blaming everything, on being underfunded and understaffed. If they're covering up medical negligence, it means the problem doesn't get dealt with and it keeps happening. And that is the fault of the NHS managers, the people who run it. 
They've got the money for 837 non-clinical staff working at English hospitals on the highest paid Band 9 contracts, which is between £99,000 and £115,000 a year. How many nurses would that pay for? How many junior doctors? And they've got the time on their hands to think about making the NHS the world's first carbon neutral health service. They've got time to consider whether women in labour should be picked up by an electric ambulance that might have to be recharged en route to the hospital. There are NHS managers with a budget of £180 billion, 2 million members of staff, and they're crying about being understaffed and under-resourced. If they spent more time looking after patients instead of finding ways to cover up avoidable deaths, then maybe we'd have a better health service. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Welcome, Welcome back. back. <laughs> <laughs> Snap. In unison. There we go. See, we've been, re we've been rehearsing That's that. twice in two days I've done that. I've been, really? Yeah. I, I did it to bed yesterday. We're bonding already. It's because yeah. you bought me an Easter egg. Yeah. It is um, 19 minutes past 10, but it's Good Friday. You don't care about the time, do you? Are you feeling good on Good yeah, Friday? I'm really good, even though I haven't eaten any of the Easter egg yet. No. Yeah, because we'll it's... We'll crack, crack it open in the next break, I, and then we can do. come back on air with chocolate around the Or night. shouldn't you eat it until Monday? I'm not sure. Just eat it. It should be hot cross buns today, surely. All of it. Anyway, Give it all. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News with Ben Leo and Dawn Neeson and a chocolate egg, which is sitting there uneaten. Now, thrilled to be joined by a political commentator, Russell Quirk, and author and broadcaster, Amy Nicole Turner. In the studio with us on Good Friday. Good morning. Good morning to you. bringing morning. gifts of eggs. I feel guilty I didn't bring chocolate. No, exactly. I think they're cancelled, Ben, don't Yeah, you? so you've not brought me any gifts? No, no I'll, chocolate. I'll run out in the break and get something. Amy? Get something. I'm, I'm against the commercialisation of Christmas, as I thought you would be. Oh, here. give off. Oh, <laughs> you've been rehearsing <laughs> Well, it's a bit late for that. <laughs> right, so what, what, what do you want to it's kick off? Christmas, not Easter. Whoops. Easter. What, <laughs> what do I want to kick off? We should we kick off with beards? We're talking about beards. Beards, right. Who beards wants to go first on beards? Um, so, this is a story from The Telegraph, which is that soldiers will be able to grow beards now in the army, which overturns a 100-year ban on facial hair. Um, so, they were banned more for practical reasons initially, to keep the protective equipment in place, so on and so forth. But then also, it, they thought it carried an air of professionalism. Um, and now the new policy comes into effect today, which means that all the soldiers on the Easter break could grow a beard if they like. Mm. Okay. Uh, Russell, is this not a bit of a, a sort of dangerous, slippery slope to falling standards, as some would argue? Do you think so? What, as in what, ending up with soldiers with kind of long hair and kind of... Uh, I mean, what's, what's next? What tattoos? Uh, do, do you know what? I think it there depends. There are tattoos already. I, I, yeah. I think so. it depends. No. I think it depends on their role in the army. So, right? We all know that special forces, I mean, famously to blend in, have been able to have facial hair for years and years and years. I think if you have a ceremonial role, then, of course, you need to look the part. So if you're part of the guards, Coldstream guards and so on. Um, but otherwise, I mean, the fact that we, up until now, have had a ban on beards in the army, I think is pretty archaic and draconian, don't you? Especially seeing as we are recovering a recruitment crisis. But it's not just any old beard, by the way, right? OK. Um, the policy is only a full-set beard. The length must be between 2.5 millimetres and 25.5 millimetres, which is an inch in old money, and must be trimmed off the cheekbones and neck. Th this is my favourite bit. There must be no patchy or uneven growth and no exaggerated colours. Just right, they're going to have sergeant majors running around with rulers measuring the length That's of soldiers' thinking. beards. And what's an exaggerated colour? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> rush yeah, over and... Is that a dyed beard? And also, there's a bit discriminatory against men who can't grow proper beards. I feel quite sorry for them. Sorry, no, beard no, discrimination. No, 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 Give me, give me three weeks, I'll be all right. <laughs> Look, on a, on a serious note, is this not... Are Russia and China and the like not looking at us and thinking, 
you know, these absolute fools talking about beards amongst the military. We've got no aircraft carriers, or at least aircraft carriers without any jets. Um, we're overrunning the Red Sea. And is this not just a complete waste of time talking about this? I wish we were instead saying, oh, we've upped the defence budget slightly. Oh, we've we no longer got a recruitment and retention problem in the army. But this is just going to hopefully increase uh, the types recruitment. of recruitment. Yeah. Got it. OK. Not sure it would be a clincher, but uh, we <laughs> remains to be seen. Well, I wish we'd try and grow one for next week and see who does best. <laughs> You'd probably beat me, yeah, to be fair. No offence. Takes me a actually, long time. Actually offended. OK, uh, <laughs> should we talk about our... Um, Fat cats. Mm, well, fat cat, water. fat cat water bosses in yes. particular. So they are in the news, just about every newspaper. Uh, the fact that Thames Water, it seems, is running out of money. Uh, of course, they are privately owned by multiple shareholders. Um, and for a whole bunch of reasons, they are running out of money uh, and have now gone to shareholders to say, we need some money in order to uh, basically uh, right our infrastructure problems. So famously, of course, these water companies lose. Is it about a third of all the water they produce that mm. comes uh, through leaks and so on? Um, of course, the big debate is the fact that a lot of these bosses are on massive salaries and bonus packages, two, three, four, five million pounds. Um, and I think most of the media this morning has focused on the fat cats and how you know clearly they're not doing their jobs despite that big pay packet. Um, and it's actually by the left, I have to say, been articulated that, that this is a reason that we shouldn't privatise anything, that we should basically nationalise everything. Now, some of us are old enough, Dawn, to remember, she and I, um, nationalisation uh, back in the 70s and 80s. It was an absolute disaster, whether that was utilities, the train companies and so on. This is not a problem of privatisation. It is a problem of the way these companies have been run, the fact that the government has not made them invest in infrastructure, but also, surely, a failure of off what. There's a regulator oh. here that clearly... What have they been doing? Well, clearly is toothless. That is the problem. I think all eyes should be on Ofwat for the fact that they've allowed this farce to continue for so long. But it's so interesting because part of their remit as regulators was to protect um, the, the shareholders' dividends. That was part of their remit, which yeah. just seems utterly bizarre. But I think it is an argument against privatisation because how can you privatise an industry um, which has no competition? I think it was always going to be doomed to fail and put it in the hands of foreign ownership and it's just completely fallen into exactly. profiteering. So would you be for um, nationalisation, Amy? Of the water industry, mm. yes, and I think mm. I'm with the vast majority. I think it's about 70% of people at the moment would support um, nationalising water. Um, interestingly, I'm in agreement today with Jacob Rees-Mogg, who said, just let it fall into administration. Let's see what happens with that. Um, but when you talk about the fat cat bosses, I actually don't agree that it should be anything to do with them because quite a few of, of the people who, who are running um, Thames Water have only just started. And that is... Imagine being tasked... With, with the company as it is right now. Um, you need to remunerate bosses for what they're doing, and it's no easy feat, obviously, to take on a task like Thames Water at the moment. So I think you do need to... I'm sorry, I've got no sympathy for these water companies. I'll say again, I say it week in, week out. I live by the coast. The amount of times I've gone down there to swim in the sea with my young kids and they're pumping raw sewage into the water, having had but, years... But again, that's a failure, that's, 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 that's a failure of the regulator. It is a failure of the regulator. Imagine being pulled in and said, right, boss that, sort that out, sort out that literal whatever's in the river. That's what I'm saying. So some of these some of these people that work there are quite new. So they've been brought in to sort out the mess. And I think well, they they're getting do... paid enough. But, these but people exactly. are on a high six, six figure salary. I don't I have no sympathy for them. They earn that salary. I don't think I, th I yeah, think but, but sorry, the, the, the difference when it comes to the privatization debate is if it's a matter of national infrastructure. So if it's power, water, telephone and so on, of course there has to be some government hands on that particular company, that particular sector and industry to ensure that it runs not just for shareholders, but actually for the benefit of the user. This is not just an ordinary company. This is not a Tesco or an HSBC. This is a water company. And yes, it's beholden to its shareholders, but there has to be regulation in place. And indeed, there is regulation in place, but my point is, off what are sitting on their hands. Yes, absolutely. Now, obviously, Thames Water aren't here to defend themselves, but they have given us a statement saying, we'd like to reassure our customers that despite this announcement, it is business as usual for Thames Water. Our 8,000 staff remain committed to working with our partners in the supply chain to provide services for our benefit benefit of our customers, communities and the environment. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've, I've had enough of the lot. I've had enough of the railways, I've had enough of the water companies. Nothing works. Prices go up, nothing works, service goes down, and it's a disgrace. So if that means renationalising it all, do it. But then it'll be happens. worse, Ben, sorry, it will be worse if it's nationalised, because it was. 30, 40 years ago, because there was no accountability whatsoever. Nationalisation is not the and answer. And two words, post office.
Yeah. OK, That's right. Nice. Should we squeeze one more story in? Uh, yep. Milton Keynes, absolute chaos in the city. 300 odd youths arrested or at least involved in a... Uh, a a big, stampede. A stampede. A yeah, stampede. what's been going on? A stampede through the... Uh, there we are. This is the video. So this is a stampede through a uh, shopping centre in Milton Keynes. I think, Amy, you live there, don't you? You live nearby. For those, I live, on, for those on radio, we can see literally hundreds, scores of kids. I think kids. they're about 300 kids. Are they in school uniform? S yeah, quite Stuffing. a lot. Oh, yeah. Um, this is as they've security, broken up from school, presumably. Security tried to intervene. They've been accused of being heavy-handed. But I think this speaks to the fact that the landscape of youth services has just been decimated and there's literally nothing for Sorry, kids. Hang on, whoa, whoa, whoa. You think that this has happened because social services have been diluted? Youth services. This is because there's no police around, there's no oversight, there's no deterrent, and 300 kids think that they can run through a shopping centre, Why frightening shoppers out of their kids lives. Going to a shopping centre. Amy, center? sorry, my kids, literally... my kids would not be behaving like that because there's no ping pong available at the local centre. Are your kids like age center? four and five? These are teenagers, and our teenagers are headed into a world where there are no leisure services. Oh, there are no Nothing to do with crime. If we up the ante on basketball, what? it's not going to stop kids being stabbed on the street. What creates antisocial behaviour is having nothing to no, do. It's lack of discipline in the home, lack of discipline in the home, and lack of policing on the what streets, and do? and a judiciary and a penal system that is utterly liberal. You're going right to the end of the line. What about the preventative? Measures? But what about the people that these people affect by running through a shopping centre and stampeding? When there's right. mothers with kids in prams, frightened out of their lives. And we're worried about the social services but I'm aspect. I'm talking about that's perhaps led You're to it. talking about stick, yeah, right? Yeah. So how long does your solution take to resolve it? Mine takes about 30 seconds. More oh. police, bang them up. Yours. Russell, should parents be fined? More police, bang them up. Uh, absolutely. And the kids should be taken to task. That, Not the security guard being taken to task because rather... he was a little bit heavy-handed. Come would on. You rather prevent this all from happening by supporting children and giving them stuff to do instead of over the past 10 years closing every Amy, I, I say closing again. sports centres, closing libraries. What did you do when you were a teenager? Do you I... Hold on, hold on. Do you, you, do you seriously think these kids would be in the library if they weren't <laughs> storming their local sports shop? I think if they had things to do and they were supported in their mental and physical health, Seems like they would these are some be of those, these are some of those likely privileged, to happen. These are some of those privileged youths in the world running around with iPhones. How do you with, know they're privileged? Of course they're privileged. They've got the, more to do now than ever. More to do now than ever. No, no, There's not no at all. There's no discipline. I, I see only and one... because we give a woke excuse for every incident that happens, that's why it continues As to happen. the only one on this panel who isn't a parent, I just have to ask this question. What, where, what happened to parental responsibility? Exactly. Surely mum and dad have to take some responsibility for how their kids behave. I think parents are, are so under so much stress at the moment. Oh. They deserve support. <laughs> and over the past 10 years, as I've said, that support has been eroded right from the beginning, from short start centres to teenagers, to, to sports centres, to leisure centres. I mean, the, the problem with this country and a lot of the West is people adopt victimhood and use it as an excuse for bad behaviour. Instead of using victimhood, which a lot of people experience, bad child whatever else, bad upbringing, instead of using that as an inspiration to do better and make sure you don't repeat those behaviours, they, they say, oh, I've had a bad childhood, so I'm going to act like an absolute melon uh, and behave like this. And people like you excuse it. I'm not excusing it. And so continue. I'm explaining it. Oh, right, OK. To I prevent it. I think we'll have to... <laughs> the grown-up in charge here with our children. Uh, thanks, Amy, and thank you, Russell, for joining us this morning. We'll see you later, I think. Now, it's time now for the news headlines with Sophia Wendler. Thanks, Dawn. It's 10.31. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB Newsroom. Your headlines. One of the Conservative Party's major donors has received a knighthood as part of a surprise honours list from Rishi Sunak. Mohammed Mansour gave £5 million to the Tories last year and is a senior treasurer for the party. He was knighted for what's described as services to business, charity and politics. The timing of the list is unusual coming while Parliament is on recess and on the eve of the Easter Bank holiday weekend. A 19-year-old man has been charged with attempted murder and possession of an offensive weapon after a stabbing on a train on Wednesday. Rakeem Thomas has been remanded into custody. He will appear at Wimbledon Magistrates Court. Police said earlier that the alleged victim, who was in his 20s, was in a critical but stable condition in hospital. Documents have revealed that the post office was aware of errors in its Horizon IT system, despite bosses proceeding with prosecutions. More than 900 sub-postmasters were wrongly prosecuted due to supposed losses flagged by a faulty computer system. 
A spokesperson for the post office says it remains fully focused on supporting the inquiry. And win for a blustery Easter weekend with strong winds and even some flood warnings in place. Ferry operators are warning of possible disruption with strong winds making for a choppy journey across the Channel. A yellow warning is in place across large parts of England throughout today. And the RAC is warning motorists to take care on the roads, with around 14 million car trips expected over the holiday. And for the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For stunning gold and silver coins you'll always value, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2618 and €1.1700. Euros. The price of gold is £1,769.69 69 per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,952 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. All right, still lots more to come. A very action-packed show in store, including how do you feel about squaddies having a beard? I'm probably the last person you should be asking about that. <laughs> but it's soon to be a reality because a top military man joins us next to explain. Also, we're going to have uh, a further discussion on the Milton Keynes youths running riot in shopping centres, scuffling with cops. And what are parents doing? Why do we have no responsibility for anything? It's always the government's fault these days. Find them. Find the parents. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News. latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Andy Hilbert. In Hertfordshire, the A1M northbound is closed due to roadworks until the early hours of tomorrow morning, Saturday morning, from Junction 6 for Welling Garden City to Junction 7 at Stevenage South. In Kent, the coastbound M20, there's a speed restriction there, uh, of course, because of Operation Brock, which has been taking place. Uh, this is going to affect you there from Junction 8 for the Maidstone services to Junction 9 at Ashford, of course. And also to in Cumbria, the northbound M6, a lane closed due to emergency barrier repairs, Junction 39 for Shaft to Junction 40 at Penrith. Uh, that's obviously going to affect you there too. And also as well on Merseyside, the southbound M6 uh, lane closed on the exit slip road due to a broken down vehicle at Junction 23 for the East Langs Road at Haydock. Again, that's going to affect you there too. That's the latest. We'll bring in more travel news here inside the next hour. You're up to date. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com <laughs> GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. Can we talk about um, uh, opening up the new uh, Bond role to someone, Alex? And, oh, um, yes. This is an actor called Aaron Taylor Johnson. Right. Do you remember when the director of the Fifty Shades of Grey films had a young, young boyfriend? Really, really young, like half her age. It was in all the papers at the time. Well, it turns out that was him. He broke his career, I think, in a film called Kick Ass, which was, I, I watched it, really great film. So you can't compare, what's his name? Who's, who's the last bomb? Daniel, Daniel Craig. Craig. Daniel Craig, you can't to Roger. Compare, you but can't. you can't compare Roger Moore to Sean Connery either. No. Who's your Can favourite Bond? Uh, my favourite Bond is Piers Brosnan, probably. Same. Really? Oh, come on, yes. Sean Connery, maybe For Sean. the classics. Yeah. I'm quite keen on Roger Moore. So, but I, I quite like the kind of uh, the ironic raise but, of the eyebrow and all well, that. Well, interesting. Interesting, this sort of puts to death all of those rumours that James Bond was going to be a woman, James Bond was going to be a black man. There was lots of different rumours going around of what they were going to do with his Idris Elba would be good. He hasn't signed yet. A he feminist, hasn't. I would say James Bond shouldn't be a woman. I totally agree. Because we need to have our own stories that we tell yeah, in our own heroes. We don't need to, yes. to kind of go in on that. We just need to have a story that celebrates a woman, I think. I agree. Who is your favourite, Eamon? So I do think if you, if you look at them all, there's not a bad one amongst them. Mm. But um, personally... Personally, I got to know Roger Moore and um, an absolute gentleman oh. and a man who was a star in every sense of the word, and an impossibly handsome looking mm, man. Mm. Pierce, I think Pierce, very, very good. And Pierce, again, is a very likeable oh, yeah. fellow. Very, very, very likeable. <laughs> yeah. It's um, funny you say that the appetite, I think, for James Bond kind of is still there, but they are reinventing it. And the fact, that, the fact that they change it and kind of go with the time. I thought Daniel Craig was very good, actually. Can't I just avoid struggled them. with Daniel Craig the most because I just couldn't cope with blonde Bond. So the idea of a female Bond or, you know, <laughs> it, I, I anything couldn't else, cope yeah. with Daniel Craig, so...
Welcome back. This is GB News with Ben and me, Dawn Neesom. And um, good Friday. Hope you're having a wonderful time out there. Now, lots of you have been getting in touch, which is exactly what we like. It's not about us, it's about you. GB Views at GB News on the screen now. Get in touch. So we've got lots of people getting in touch about foreign aid and water. Yeah, so foreign aid, as a reminder, we're sending £89 million to Sudan in the wake of their civil war. That's been bumped up from previous figures. Robert says foreign aid should be withdrawn until we get ourselves back on our feet. I'm amazed we give millions to India who have a nuclear and space agency. Well, actually, that stopped a couple of years back, but that was the case. I think from 2016 to 2021, we gave India at least hundreds of millions, but that's been stopped. Yeah. So it was a massive and we are story. still giving it to China, yeah, which so, I'm struggling with. To so China with you. is the new one. Last yeah. year, eight and a half million pounds, all while they're building bases for humans on the moon. Yeah. Meanwhile, Tony, good morning. Is it still morning? Still morning. Good morning, Tony. He says, um, foreign aid should be scrapped, but neither Labour or the Conservatives will do it. We need a referendum. Oh, not another one. Uh, Peter says we... Another one? Another referendum. No, we're still talking about the last one. <laughs> Peter says we have our own people in poverty and starving. We need to look after our own before we give millions in foreign aid. And Michael says we borrow money every year, so why should we give money away when it should be spent at home uh, on our people, on our homeless, and even in local communities, uh, and even on border force? Well, this is the thing, isn't it, Ben? I mean, it's a cost of living crisis. We're all filling the pinch. We're all skimp, basically, not to put too fine a point on it, but we're giving millions of pounds away. Yeah, what but about I, education, the I NHS, was, I was looking at some stats earlier. We were, about five years, years ago, we were second or third biggest foreign aid contributor in the world. I think now we're down to about 16th. So it seems like the government has been listening. The, the, the problem with foreign aid, Ben, is we're giving all this money away, but the situation in the countries where we're giving it to isn't getting any better. Mm. Sudan is one case in point. Well, the, the, the Sudan money, 89 million, that's going towards feeding and housing 500,000 yeah. under fives, but which I, I completely back, of Yeah, course. no, absolutely. We started it a year ago, though, and still the militia are fighting, and it's got worse, the fighting out there. So I know, I is also, it helping? I also question these charities as well. Uh, I'm not going to name the one involved in Sudan who we've given money to, but a lot of the time with these charities, the CEOs are on massive yes. six-figure salaries, their staff costs are through the roof. You saw with Oxfam in Haiti the stuff they got up to. So, uh, yeah, there is big yeah, concerns. Yeah, how do we know it goes to the right place? Any case, should we talk about beards? Yeah. Yes, let's. Uh, soldiers will be allowed to grow beards after the army overturned a 100-year ban on facial hair. Yeah, and don't worry, because we shouldn't have a nation of scruffs, as troops have been told. These beards have to be neat and tidy, with standards within the army not dropping. Right, OK, and maybe it might help with the recruitment crisis, which is affecting all our armed forces. Uh, joining us now is former head of counter-terrorism counter at the Ministry of Defence, Major General Chip Chapman. <laughs> Chip, good morning. Thank you very much for joining us on Good Friday. Hope you're having a wonderful Easter weekend. Uh, Chip, what do you make of this story? Well, it's a bit of a non-issue for someone like me. My my point has always been to look at how well will people fight rather than how uniform they look on Horse Guards Parade. So does it affect fighting power, having a beard? No, it does not. Does not allowing beards in the army uh, affect those in the attract space and the mean target audience to come into the army? Yes, it does. So a number of studies looking at quantitative data have shown that Gen Z, the generation you're trying to recruit, 34% of those have a beard, highest in the 25 to 30 age group of 44%. And 62% of those did not know that a beard was not allowed in the army. And 22% of that 62 would said it would stop them applying, uh, applying to join the army. And that was highest in the 17 to 24 age group where most of the new recruits come from, and particularly the impacts on those of uh, black, Asian and Muslim propensity who uh, have a higher uh, percentage of beard wearing than others. So you're excluding quite a number of people from joining the army if you don't change the policy to having beards. Now, most people have always had a, um, a, a fear that in a nuclear, biological or chemical environment, you need a seal on a respirator and therefore mm. you can't have a beard. That is true. But in terms of that, you would always know about imminency and have indications and warnings. So that is a false argument for not having a beard. So, Chip, why are the SAS, for example, the regiment, why are they allowed beards? I mean, traditionally, we, the stereotype of an SAS soldier is a, a big burly man with tats and he has a, you know, a, a very nice, fully grown beard and, you know, a bit of, bit of scruffy hair as well. Well, there are always tribes and idiosyncrasies within the army. You could, your argument again there, Ben, for example, you won't find many chin dips in... Second World War without beard. You look at the Victorian Army, it's bearded uh, up the yin-yang. You know, everyone in the Crimean War has a beard. 
the Victorian Army around the Zulu Wars has a beard. Mm. Uh, the drum majors in a regiment, they're allowed a beard. The pioneer sergeant is allowed a beard. So there's always been these idiosyncrasies. It's just what is a matter of policy or not. Um, the SAS tend to make their own policies, so for them it's slightly different. But if the policy is that you're now allowed to have beards, as long as it is, it is neatly trimmed, and they're saying that's a full set between a grade one, 2.5, millimeters and grade eight 25.5 millimeters which in our currency is one inch and that's fine by me chip i'm sorry my love but i mean given how the, the current levels of woke recruitment we have seen recently where you can have anybody and everybody join up um surely we're, we're splitting hairs no pun intended here i mean i want someone who can go on fight for the country. I don't care if they've got a beard or not. And I certainly don't want senior officers getting a ruler out and measuring how fitting that is. We've got a recruitment crisis. Why don't we just recruit people who can do the blooming job? Well, that's where I started. If you recall there at dawn, how well will they fight? Does it affect fighting power? Fighting power is the ability to go forward if necessary and kill the king's enemies. That's what I, the people I want to be involved with, uh, not if we're people are picking hairs on beards. To give you an example where something like this occurred in my career, I went to a number of focus groups uh, in when I was uh, commanding two para about whether we should legalize homosexuality uh, in the army, like the LGBT community. And again, my line uh, then was, can he or she fight? If she wants to fight and will fight, that's good enough for me. So, Chip, there, there's lots of screenshots doing the rounds online this morning from soldiers who have had text messages from the, the, uh, the, the you know, powers that be in their unit saying, I don't care about this new policy. Our policy in this unit going forward is as has been, no bids. Well, they'd be wrong, and they, that would show their lack of understanding of a new policy. You're always going to get that from particularly RSMs, regimental sergeant majors, who do like this sort of notion of complete uniformity. But in a modern army, you need to have a thinking army, not an army which is a TikTok army, because you win wars by having a thinking organization, not an organization which is by rote and drills. Chip, one final question for you quickly. Is there a red line for you? Is there an, an area that you, you think would be going too far if you allowed recruits to do it? Well, there's still those things to do with tattoos and body piercings and uh, those things to do with, um, uh, what they call it, um, flesh tunnels. So I think allowing flesh tunnels, for example, would be going too far in terms of recruiting. Tattoos, I think they'll change the policy a bit uh, in, the, in the near future, particularly to do with a, uh, they, they're using military judgment panels. Just decentralise it and trust people to make a decent judgment. OK, Major General Chip Chapman. Formerly of the MOD, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. One quick email that's come in and said, uh, it's from Martin, he says, in the Royal Navy, the rule was always that you could have a beard if you could grow it and it was full within seven days. But they've all, the, all three forces have had different rules. The mm. Navy have always allowed beards. That hasn't been a problem. I think the Army one, for, according to a lot of your emails today, is because of the gas mask thing. Oh, right, yeah. Didn't if, you, if, you, if you've got a full beard on, it's, you'll struggle to put on a, a yeah, gas mask. Indeed, right, OK. Well, we move on now, unfortunately. The Tavistock Gender Clinic has closed. It's been covered in controversy. Our reporter is at the site. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News. Don't go too far. Morning. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office. The Easter weekend is here and the weather looks like slowly turning a little drier and a little warmer, with many of us likely to have a fine day on Sunday. Yeah, far from fine out there today, although some of us starting off with a bit of sunshine, but showers already in some places and the showers just get going more widely from late morning through into the early afternoon. Heavy, even thundery showers zipping through on a fairly brisk breeze, so it won't rain all day, but when the showers come along, hail thunder is also possible. Temperatures may be just sneaking up a bit compared to yesterday, but still feeling cool when the showers hit and because of that brisk wind. That will continue to blow showers across the UK through this evening and uh, overnight they should tend to fade in many locations, uh, but we'll keep some going across the west coast of uh, Wales, southwest England, and some continuing to push into parts of Scotland also. But many central and eastern parts of England turning dry and clear. Pretty chilly as well, temperatures well down into single digits to start Saturday.
But we should start with a bit of sunshine on Saturday. Tomorrow morning, fine over the Midlands and eastern England in particular. And generally, although there will still be showers around tomorrow, not as many as today. A better chance that most of tomorrow will be dry and bright, particularly across parts of southern England. Could see some more rain returning to the southwest later on. But a bit more in the way of sunshine, feeling a bit warmer. And for many of us, Sunday looks decent too. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back. Now, the Tavistock Gender Identity Development Service is closing for good this weekend, two years after a damning report highlighted major concerns. So joining us now uh, is our reporter, Ray Addison, who is down at the scene in central London. Good morning, Ray. So it's finally closed, the long-awaited um, closure of this very controversial clinic. It, the licence was extended, though, wasn't it? It was meant to close some time ago, wasn't it? What happened? Yeah, it was supposed to close uh, a year ago. That was extended while uh, NHS England has been setting up a regional service. They've currently now got uh, two parts of that uh, eight-part regional service established. There's one here uh, in London at Great Ormond Street uh, Hospital that will be trying to re replace this. Ultimately, they'll have um, a, a gender service, gender clinic service in uh, all uh, eight regions of England. Uh, but mixed emotions, I think, from from members of the public, from those who've been associated with this clinic. Of course, there's those who believe that it was providing, you know, an essential, possibly even life-saving treatment to young people who are desperate to change their gender. And, of course, those who believe that it was consumed by an ideology which overrode the need for proper medical ethics and standards. And, of course, that meant that children were then receiving these life-changing puberty blockers instead of psychological treatment which uh, could have explored other options of course once you've had those puberty blockers uh, you cannot go back now many of those who've, who've worked here over the years have tried to raise concerns some have resigned uh, in protest the very first whistleblower was Sue Evans uh, and uh, she blew the whistle back in 2005 she says she's relieved to see the clinic close I feel pleased. Obviously, I had huge anxieties about the service that the children were being given there. Um, I felt they were being rushed into to medicalised treatments at a much too early age. So I'm, I'm, and really, the Tavistock dudes would not listen, and neither would the board at the Tavistock, which was why Marcus Evans resigned as a governor because they wouldn't listen to the concerns raised by the whistleblowers and David Bell's report. Um, and I think that really the clinical standards and the child safeguarding in that area had really fallen well below standards. So some will be breathing a sigh of relief as we're hearing there. However, 15,000 young people remain on the waiting list uh, for just to, to receive their very first appointment at a gender clinic here in the UK. And so they will be very concerned by this and will be hoping that the replacement service is adequate and up and running effectively. All right, good stuff. Thank you very much. Uh, live from the Tavistock 
clinic which has closed today. Amy Nicole Turner joins us again now. Amy, can children consent to puberty blockers? Um, well, if you're talking about puberty blockers, then at the Tavistock, only 83 children were prescribed puberty blockers last year. Um, they're still being prescribed to teens who are facing precocious puberty. Yes, they have been banned by the NHS, but they can still be prescribed privately. Now, if there was a massive issue around the safety of these drugs, they wouldn't be being prescribed privately. So this is, well, more, no, of that, a, that's this is the, more of a political move than anything else to there, appease there, there is, arguments <laughs> such as your own. I mean, that, that, there is a move for, for that loophole to be closed. Liz Truss tried to introduce a <laughs> private member's bill some weeks ago, which Labour filibustered. She wanted to, to close the loophole that allowed uh, people, particularly children, getting these... Uh, Lupron is the name of the chemical, the puberty blocker, getting them from private clinics. So there is an attempt to close that loophole because... But does Liz Truss want to close the loophole on precocious puberty as well? Because, as far as I can see, cisgender children are still being prescribed these drugs. What's a cisgender and also, child? Um, also, Liz Truss, last time I checked, I mean, I'm not sure, is not a qualified medical professional. Amy, they, they give... Um, they if give... we look at the... Um, if we look at bodies that do support puberty blockers and do... Well, not... They would never be a first um, first stop anyway. They would always... Like, the Tavistock was primarily focused on providing counselling and psychotherapy to OK, so, you, so you're saying every, everything's, everything's fine... Everything's dysphoria. fine with the Tavistock. So why have they been ordered to close under the CASP? Because review? they were under such massive demand that they're now... Open. You think it's just political? No. No, I don't. The Tavistock had massive waiting lists. There was one, it was one centre. So that means they are now opening eight smaller hubs to be able to absorb the waiting lists and actually help these children. Did you know it's, it's been alleged that the Tavistock, um, that 97.5% of children seeking sex changes there had autism, depression or other conditions that might have explained their own unhappiness and their own statistics from kids at the Tavistock, 35% of children there seeking sex changes had autism, which is far above so, the, the national average. Well, that's probably why we need more clinics like the Tavistock and why eight regional hubs are opening so that those children experiencing those symptoms, such as that eventually are diagnosed with autism, can seek the help. At the moment, what you've got is 15,000 children on waiting lists who may have autism, who may have depression, who may have an eating disorder, but at the moment they cannot find out because of the waiting lists for these clinics. The, the, the problem with the Tavistock is... It, it's stopped doing the counselling and started doing the drug prescription, he didn't. including 300... OK, That's I'm going to have to wrap you. Thank you, Amy. 83 we're last year. Yeah, we're going to speak to uh, Philip Davies, <laughs> who's been given a knighthood. I'll ask him if it's honours for the boys. Stay with us. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Morning. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office. The Easter weekend is here and the weather looks like slowly turning a little drier and a little warmer, with many of us likely to have a fine day on Sunday. Yeah, far from fine out there today, although some of us starting off with a bit of sunshine, but showers already in some places and the showers just get going more widely from late morning through into the early afternoon. Heavy, even thundery showers zipping through on a fairly brisk breeze, so it won't rain all day, but when the showers come along, hail, thunder is also possible. Temperatures maybe just sneaking up a bit compared to yesterday, but still feeling cool when the showers hit and because of that brisk wind. That will continue to blow showers across the UK through this evening and uh, overnight they should tend to fade in many locations uh, but we'll keep some going across the west coast of uh, Wales, southwest England and some continuing to push into parts of Scotland also but many central and eastern parts of England turning dry and clear. Pretty chilly as well, temperatures well down into single digits to start Saturday. But we should start with a bit of sunshine on Saturday. Tomorrow morning, fine over the Midlands and eastern England in particular. And generally, although there will still be showers around tomorrow, not as many as today. A better chance that most of tomorrow will be dry and bright, particularly across parts of southern England. Could see some more rain returning to the southwest later on. But a bit more in the way of sunshine, feeling a bit warmer. And for many of us, Sunday looks decent too. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of Weather on GB News.
It's the final week to see how you could win big. You could win an amazing £12,345 in tax-free cash that you could spend however you like. Plus, there's a further £500 of shopping vouchers to spend at your favourite store. We'll also give you a gadget package to use in your garden this spring. That includes a games console, a pizza oven and a portable smart speaker so you can listen to GB News on the go. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria De Piero, bringing you... PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good morning to you and a very blessed Good Friday. It's Friday, March 29th, 11am. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News with me, Ben Leo, and Dawn Neeson. Now, should parents be fined? A Section 34 dispersal order is in place after a large gang fight and antisocial behaviour involving around 300 children and teenagers in Milton Keynes. And honours for the boys. Rishi Sunak sparks an honours row after awarding a top gong to a top Tory donor. The Labour Party chair, Annalise Dodds, gave her reaction earlier. Of, of astonishment. You know, you either uh, would feel that perhaps Rishi Sunak is so arrogant that he doesn't mind any more what the public think, or perhaps he's demob happy. He believes that he's on the way out. If anything, it demonstrates yet again his weakness. And is Thames Water going under? Leveling up Secretary Michael Gove has blasted the water company after bosses asked to raise bills by 40% to avoid nationalisation. The answer is for the management team to look to their own approach and ask themselves why they're in this difficult situation. And of course the answer is because of serial mismanagement for which they must carry the can. And the iconic boat race between Oxford and Cambridge is still going ahead tomorrow, despite the levels of pollution in the River Thames. Easter travel warning. Millions of us will be impacted by chaos on the roads, rails and ferries today. Let us know if you've been affected and how you're coping.
and a very happy Good Friday to you. Let us know what you're up to this bank holiday weekend. I'm working, unfortunately, today, tomorrow and Monday. But well, I, 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 Unfortunately, <laughs> you're working with me, Ben. Come on. OK, oh, it's no, a thrill. I love it. It's I a thrill. It. <laughs> Although I do have the Easter Sunday off. We have a nice Easter breakfast, which I'm very much looking forward to. Yes, absolutely. I'm not invited to that one, am I? No. Champagne for breakfast? Oh, no, okay. not this weekend. But this isn't about us and what we're doing and our views. It's about you. So email us at gbviews at gbnews.com. Tell us what you're doing this Easter. Tell us how you're celebrating. And tell us whether you're caught in that travel chaos out there. And also, by the way, I want to know whether you agree with parents being fined for unruly children. We saw those pictures from Milton Keynes, 300 kids and teenagers uh, running riot, pretty much, in a shopping centre, scuffling with police. Are the parents to blame? I think so. Let us know what you think. Before all that, here's your news with Sophia. Thanks, Ben. Good morning. It's 11 o'clock. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB Newsroom. Your top story this hour, one of the Conservative Party's major donors has received a knighthood as part of a surprise honours list from Rishi Sunak. Mohammed Mansour gave £5 million to the Tories last year and is a senior treasurer for the party. He was knighted for what's described as services to business, charity and politics. Other recipients include MPs Philip Davies and Esther McVeigh, who are also former presenters on this network. Labour Party chairwoman Annalise Dodds says it's the act of a prime minister who doesn't expect to have his job for much longer. It seems to be an almost automatic pass now under the Conservatives, and particularly the individual, uh, Mr Mansour, who was last year, last January, the biggest ever donor to the Conservatives, £5 million at that stage, the biggest individual donation that had been given, then seeming to have that automatic pass through to receiving uh, uh, an honour under Rishi Sunak. I think, if anything, it demonstrates yet again his weakness, that he's focused on internal party issues all of the time, rather than on the needs of our country. The timing of the list is unusual, coming while Parliament is in recess and on the eve of the Easter bank holiday weekend. We asked people in Hull what they think of the Tory MPs receiving honours. Think much of, of anything. One or two of them must probably try, but to me, majority of MPs are like bananas. They bunch together. They're all yellow. There's not a straight one among them. But it, it, it's it's self-serving, isn't it? I mean, the, the, these people reward themselves for for what? I don't I don't quite understand. I don't get it. It's just a con, really. You know, it's to just uh, to give the. The Conservatives put other Labour Party money for they want favours in return. So this is this is a problem. Documents have revealed that the post office was aware of errors in its Horizon IT system, despite bosses proceeding with prosecutions. More than 900 sub postmasters were wrongly prosecuted due to supposed losses flagged by a faulty computer system. A draft report carried out by Deloitte was commissioned by the post office in 2016. It shows that top managers knew that financial discrepancies may not be the fault of sub-postmasters, but continued to fight them in court regardless. A spokesperson for the post office says it remains fully focused on supporting the inquiry. A 19-year-old man has been charged with attempted murder and possession of an offensive weapon after stabbing on a train on Wednesday. Rakeem Thomas was being remanded in custody. He will appear at Wimbledon Magistrates Court. It's after an incident between Beckenham Junction and Shortlands train stations. The alleged victim, who is in his 20s, was taken to hospital, where police earlier said he's in a critical but stable condition. In other news, the task of clearing Baltimore's port will take considerable time after President Biden committed $60 million to rebuilding the collapsed bridge. It's after a cargo ship crashed into one of the key bridge's foundations on Tuesday. The enormous wreckage remains in the port, with the ship measuring about as long as the Eiffel Tower. Maryland's governor, Wes Moore, says they're facing an incredibly complex job to reopen the port. And we're in for a blustery Easter weekend with strong winds and even some flood warnings in place. Ferry operators are warning of possible disruption with strong winds, making for a choppy journey across the channel. A yellow warning is in place across large parts of England throughout today and the RAC is warning motorists to take care on the roads with around 14 million car trips expected over the holiday. And in case your Easter weekend isn't quite sweet enough, Jerry Seinfeld is to star in a new film about the origin of the Pop-Tart. 
The legendary sitcom actor is also making his debut as a director in the story of how two rival cereal companies raced to create a pastry that would apparently change the face of breakfast. It's a dream project for the comedian who says he's been working on the story for several years. Unfrosted, the Pops Tart story also features Hugh Grant and Melissa McCarthy and will premiere on Netflix on the 3rd of May. And for the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now, it's back to Dawn and Ben. Thanks very much, Sophia. It is seven minutes past 11 and um, happy Good Friday, if you meant to say that, or I hope you have a nice evening. Not sure that's allowed again. anymore, Dawn. Oh, we cancelled that one. Mentioning Christianity, I think it's been uh, uh, I erased. Just, I was just thinking Friday culture. was meant to be more sober rather than any other reason. But Well, Jesus died on the cross today and then Sunday, of course, is when... Uh, Christ rises. But uh, should we see what you've been saying in your emails? Lots of you getting riled about foreign aid. Brian says, good morning, Brian. Yes, foreign aid should be stopped. We have enough issues of our own that need to be sorting out. No other countries offer us help. The money sent to Sudan will probably be used for arms anyway. Exactly. And Ted says we should abolish foreign aid. Why are we giving more aid to Afghanistan than we're giving to the Ukraine? Most countries we give aid to are very contentious of our country. We should trade to our advantage, but otherwise give nothing. Uh, Ian says we're no longer an empire and we have plenty of have-nots. Cease foreign aid and look to our own. Uh, I am for it in cases uh, in Sudan. I, I'm quite sure a lot of that's going to go to waste through charities. But, of course, when it's funding half a million kids under five to be fed, of course I back that. However, what I don't back is eight and a half million pounds going to China who wants to build a base on the moon. Well, it's exactly. But this, this is an interesting message as well. There's a lady called Emma. Good afternoon, Emma. And she says, talking about the Milton Keynes story, which is a lot of you are getting in touch about this one. She says, unruly kids. The problem is not not having a youth club. The problem is woke culture. It's bad parenting, uh, mass immigration from gang cultures. And the problem is, yes, very sorry, it's gang and knife crime. My mum used, used to give me the wooden spoon on my behind when I was young. Not saying we should do that now, but, you know... I never went running right in shopping centres. So, we're going to ask this morning, should parents be fined for their children's bad behaviour? That's what we're asking after around 300 children. Some of them in school uniform were seen charging through a shopping centre before confronting security in Milton Keynes. And if you're listening on the radio, you can basically see scores of youths running around, scuffling with cops, uh, just causing absolute chaos. So, joining us now in the studio to discuss whether parents ought to be fined for their naughty kids, a GB News power couple, Patrick Christie's... <laughs> And Emily Carver. Hello. What do you reckon? Oh, so nice to see you here in daytime, by the way. Yes, I am uh, stepping in for Tom Harwood today, so I'm looking forward to it. It's a bit of a, a nice surprise. So, um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, what well, we are going to be talking about whether or not parents should be fined or, dare I say, even sent to prison if they have unruly kids. I mean, there was a moment a few years ago, wasn't there, where I think if children were repeatedly playing truant from school, then parents would face the full force of that. I suppose part of the problem in this case might be you'd have to find the parents. Yes, because <laughs> fundamentally, these are children. And, yes, you can come down hard on the children, but you've got to look at who's raising the children and who's responsible why, for why? them. And it is parents. And I'm sorry, there's absolutely no way that I would have been anywhere close to that at the age of these children. If I had been, I would have been in my room, locked in my room for God knows how long, I'm sure. And, you know, it's about parents following up. With so were you, were you saved, though, really, by, by playing ping-pong in a youth club? Did that stop you doing this sort of behaviour? Well, many things stopped me from doing that, <laughs> but, uh, yes, the ping-pong did help. Uh, that uh, <laughs> took my mind off going absolutely feral in a shopping centre in Milton Keynes. Well, that's what, on a serious note, that's what Amy Nicole Turner was just saying. She said there's no libraries open, mm. there's no youth centres. I mean, the door made the point was Bless that... Bless her, Amy. <sighs> I know she makes these arguments, but <laughs> sometimes I just think... Um... Yes, I'm not sure that's the whole picture, is it? I'm not sure a library is going to stop these yobbos from going through why, this shopping centre. Why do you centre? think parental... When I was growing up, I mean, it wasn't a wooden spoon, it was the, the sharp end of my dad's belt, the buckle end. Ooh, why ouch. do you think... Yeah, I'm not suggesting that's a good thing, by the way. Um, but why do you think parental responsibility now is almost non-existent? It's always the government's fault. Mm. Well, well, this is a symptom, really, of personal responsibility just being completely eroded, isn't there? I do think that there is an issue, and it's an uncomfortable topic to talk about, but fatherless 
homes mm. amongst certain communities. That is a problem, OK? I think you also have this idea now that, like you said, that everything is somebody else's fault. Well, you know, maybe I have to work two jobs, therefore I can't know where my kid is all the time. Well, that's one thing, but um, there's been incidences in the past where, you know, a, a 12 or 13-year-old boy on the back of a moped has been done for stabbing someone, and you think, how did his parents not know where he was? Yeah. Is there really any care. excuse for they that? Care, probably. No. And schools, as well as another point yeah. in all of this, yeah. uh, I know that uh, Catherine Burblesing at the Michaela Academy has been tweeting about it, saying, this isn't import importing American culture. This is what a lot of children are like if you don't give them discipline yeah. in schools. And she gets hounded for it. But, you know, this is... This, you know this... what? A lot of teachers are facing an uphill battle with this because they try and discipline one of their pupils who's been misbehaving. Parents come in and say, how dare you discipline my child? And actually, I think it's... I mean, it's totally... Like, if, if, if I was in trouble, my parents would be on the teacher's side. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You've been marched back Nowadays, up to it's the other way around. Yes. The problem is, you've got kids going to school now, we covered it this week on the channel, who aren't potty trained. I remember mm. when I was at school, there were some kids who used to be sent in with packets of crisps for breakfast. Mm. And it might seem like a trivial point in isolation, but, you know, I think this... It's a symptom. The discipline starts young. If you can't tell, look after your own kids when they're four or five, then what chance have you got when they're teenagers running yeah. around with zombie knives? No, well, exactly. Let's hope... Uh, what else is on your show? There are more good parents out there than bad. Well, well uh, I did a sit-down with Robert Jemrick, the former immigration minister, yesterday. Now, the full version of that is going to be playing on my show latest night, 9 till 11pm. But we've got some snippets of it, which we will show you a bit later on. Uh, these include him, quite astonishingly, saying, as former immigration minister, he was supposed to have a fortnightly meeting with the prime minister on immigration, and Rishi Sunak, he claims, refused to talk to him about legal immigration, raises serious questions about whether or not the prime minister actually cares yes, about yeah. it. And, of course, maybe this is why reform are doing quite well at the moment, Emily. Also, I want to talk about the Garrick Club, um, not because I care so much about the Garrick Club, but I'm up. horrified by these so-called feminists who mm. seem to care more about one men's only elite club in London than they do about the variety, the smorgasbord, whatever you want to call it, the plethora of issues that are actually facing women today. Apparently... I mean, why do they care so much about the Garrett Club? Do they want to join the Garrett Club? Do they just want to bring down everything that's seen to be mm. in any way elitist? Is this really the worst misogynistic thing out there? Apparently, former Tory MP Amber Rudd is going to be one of the first female members of the Garrett Club. I mean, it's ludicrous. Right. Why, why would you want to sit Just make your own club. And listen to a load of boring men, Emily. Well, quite. Uh, have, have they not got the Women's Institute? I mean, why don't we see this in reverse? I think mm. it's about just tearing down anything that you don't d don't approve of. But you mm. can I mean, join the Women's just... Institute, you're not banned. This is what they're saying. They're saying well, not only that women should be allowed in, OK, fine, but that they want to get rid of all private members' clubs that exist. I mean, that's freedom of association. Mm. Yeah. I mean, there are much more important issues, I would argue, anyway, facing uh, women. We're also going to be talking about Angela Rayner uh, as well, of course, because the pressure is still ramping up on Angela. At some point, is she going to show us her papers? I think maybe she should. It would all go away. Keir Starmer, right, conveniently distancing himself from it. I have absolute faith she's satisfied me for it, but he's not actually seeing the evidence, is he? You yeah, only she, do that. She's not shown him either. Her meeting with a, uh, an accountant recently that mm. proves she's innocent, or the uh, documents from 15 years ago whenever this issue first kicked off. If yeah. he's the first to demand uh, tax affairs are published when it's a Conservative MP. Is taking a big gamble on... He is, actually, yeah, I think so, unless he knows something that we don't know or that uh, the, the public well, don't I know. I think it's fear of what could come next, because the way they elect their deputy leaders, of course, is done purely by the membership. So mm. if somebody, hypothetically speaking, like Zara Sultana, was to stand, for example, really opposed to what Keir Starmer has been doing over Gaza, etc., that could pose him a massive headache. So I've that and much Very more. Very good point. More of that analysis right. at 12 o'clock. Okay. Sounds like a cracking show. Good afternoon, Britain, from 12, with Patrick and Emily, and also Patrick Christie's tonight. Hey. That exclusive inter uh, interview with former immigration Minister Robert Jenrick. Right, up next we'll be speaking to one of those MPs who have been given a surprise knighthood. Are the honours deserved or is Rishi Sunak just doing his mates a favour? This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News. Patrick Christie's Tonight, weekdays from 9pm. Has the NHS killed your relative and then lied to you about it? There is an alleged cover-up culture in the NHS. They lie to you about why your loved one died, about poor care, then bury documents with evidence in them, and they try to silence staff who speak out. This is according to the NHS Ombudsman. There are around 11,000 avoidable deaths every year. 11,000. Someone's mum dies, their children know something dodgy happened, 
And then they're met with a rotten culture, including the altering of care plans, the disappearance of crucial documents and complete denials. They lie to you, but they really get away with it because the NHS is like a religion and people dare not criticise it. You'd be accused of nhs phobia. The annual budget is around £180 billion, and we now have about 2 million people working for the NHS. They cannot keep blaming everything on being underfunded and understaffed. If they're covering up medical negligence, it means the problem doesn't get dealt with, and it keeps happening. And that is the fault of the NHS managers, the people who run it. They've got the money for 837 non-clinical staff working at English hospitals on the highest paid band nine contracts, which is between £99,000 and £115,000 a year. How many nurses would that pay for? How many junior doctors? And they've got the time on their hands to think about making the NHS the world's first carbon neutral health service. They've got time to consider whether women in labour should be picked up by an electric ambulance that might have to be recharged en route to the hospital. There are NHS managers with a budget of £180 billion, 2 million members of staff, and they're crying about being understaffed and under-resourced. If they spent more time looking after patients instead of finding ways to cover up avoidable deaths, then maybe we'd have a better health service. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, it is 18 minutes past 11 on Good Friday. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News with the lovely Ben Leo and Meadon Neeson. Hope you're having a wonderful Easter out there. Now, the Prime Minister has sparked an Easter honours row as he's announced a knighthood for major Conservative Party donor, Egyptian-born billionaire Mohammed Mansour, who's donated £5 million to the Tories over the last year. On breakfast this morning, Stephen and Ellie asked Labour Party Chair Annalise Dodds about what she thought about the honours system. It seems to be an almost automatic pass now under the Conservatives, and particularly the individual, uh, Mr Mansour, who was last year, last January, the biggest ever donor to the Conservatives, £5 million at that stage, the biggest individual donation that had been given, then seeming to have that automatic pass through to receiving uh, uh, an honour under Rishi Sunak. I think, if anything, it demonstrates yet again his weakness, that he's focused on internal party issues all of the time, rather than on the needs of our country. Interesting. OK, now, one of the four MPs to receive an honour, Philip Davis, who represents Shipley. We'll hear from him in just a moment. But first, Anna Riley has been getting reaction from the people in Hull. It's self-serving, isn't it? I mean, the, the, these people reward themselves. For, for what? I don't, I don't quite understand. Well, I don't think they it's there because once they're in power, they just do what they like and just don't care about the common people. Well, it's, it's just a con, really, you know. It's they're just there. They give the, the concepts for other Labour Party money for they want favours in return. To me, the majority of MPs are like bananas. They bunch together, they're all yellow, there's not a straight one among them. It's absolutely fine for them to get honours, provided that they're merited, and that means actually some voluntary work or making a very long-standing contribution to you know, political work. What it shouldn't mean is uh, a big donation to a political party. OK, interesting. I love that, describing MPs as bananas. 
<laughs> OK, now let's uh, go to um, Philip Davis, Conservative MP for Shiplin, who is one of those now. We have to call Sir. Sir Philip, is it now? It is. It seems rather absurd, doesn't it, Dawn? So uh, I, I, don't, I, think, I don't think you need, you need to call me that, to be perfectly honest. So, Philip, the one question I have to ask is, is what have you done to deserve it? Well, that's not really for me to answer, Dawn, is it? To be perfectly honest, I didn't award this to myself. Uh, it was awarded to me, so it's not for me. Uh, it's not for me to decide that. That's for other people, and, and uh, uh, people will have their own opinion about whether any honour is merited or not. And uh, you, you only have to look at social media, and you'll see that some people think it's the best decision that Rishi Sunak's ever made, and some people think it's an absolute disgrace. And twas ever thus, I suppose. But. It's not for me to say whether I deserve it or not, or what I've done. It's for, like I say, I did to award it to myself. Do you think you deserve it? Well, look, I, I think probably. I mean, I've never been in this position before, but people feel. But I think certainly from my point of view, I always, I certainly feel that there's uh, lots more more deserving people than me uh, to be to be honoured. Um, but you know, I'm I'm still immensely proud, and and uh, you know, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm very pleased for. Lots of people who have helped me along the way, my family, my local Shipley Conservative Association, who took a gamble and selected me 22 years ago to be their parliamentary candidate. The people of Shipley that have re-elected me on many occasions to serve them in Parliament. I'm, I'm really pleased and grateful for all of their support because ultimately it, it wouldn't have happened without them. That's that's really what I what I feel. I don't sit here feeling smugly that I deserve it. I probably feel that I don't deserve it, but nevertheless, I still feel extremely proud and grateful. Phil, you are one of the Conservative MPs who are still very loyal to Rishi Sunak. You speak out very eloquently supporting him. Um, do you think that's the reason? Because, you know, you are on Team Rishi when so many Conservative MPs no longer are. <laughs> Don't, I, I, however many ways you ask me the same question, I, I can't answer. I can't answer why I was why I was given this honour. I I didn't uh, award it to myself. Come on, Phil. Like, Do you think you would have been given the honour if you if you weren't such a big uh, supporter of the Prime Minister? I, I genuinely don't know, Ben. Look, the thing is, if you look at my voting record in Parliament, I think I've voted against the Conservative whip more times than any other Conservative MP. If, if an MP uh, started out in Parliament and said, look, my aim in life is to be uh, given a knighthood, I certainly wouldn't recommend the fault they follow the path I've taken, to be perfectly honest. And still, I think if you look at my voting record since Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister, I still think you'll probably find me in the higher echelons of those who've rebelled uh, against the government. So, look, I, I, I don't know. I can't, I can't answer for why the decision was made. There were, there were certainly far more loyal, loyal Conservative MPs following the Conservative whip than me. Phil, a lot of our readers are not happy with this. They're, they're saying it's cronyism. Why don't the Tory party concentrate on the real problems going on in this country? And the timing is, some are saying, suspicious. Snuck out just before Easter, so we all sort of overlook it and it moves on by the time we're all back to work next week. What do you say to that? Well, again, they're not really questions for me, Dawn. They're questions for the people who, who drew up the honours list and for the people who announced it. I, I didn't do any of that. I, I'm a recipient. I'm, I'm not one of the people who actually made the decision or, or, or made, decided on the timing or, or anything like that. I, I, they're, they're, you're asking the wrong person those questions, I fear. OK, Phil, well, listen, congratulations. Uh, from our questions, we don't want to take away any of the pride that you must be feeling with this honour. And uh, lots of your constituents are emailing and on Twitter saying it's thoroughly deserved. You've served them for many, many years quite loyally. So congratulations to you. And as you said, you should be feeling proud. Um, so happy Thank Easter you to much. you. Enjoy Thank you. and uh, have a good weekend. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. Thank you. you. Sir Phil. Thank Sir Philip. Sir Phil. Yes. Sir have Phil. To, you have Sir to get Philip. used to that. So, is the honours system, Dawn, broken? Well, on the grounds that I'm never going to get anything, I personally would say yes, wouldn't you? Well, if I ever become it's PM or... Like, it's just cronyism. Why I'll, 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 I'll sort you out a, uh, a peerage or something. Dame Dawn. If I ever become Dame Prime Minister. Dame Dawn's got a ring to it. Yeah, yeah sounds, good. Like that. sounds good. Yeah. Let's yeah. get the thoughts of our panel now. We're joined by political commentator Russell Quirk and broadcaster and author Amy Nicole Turner. What do you make of that, Russell? Honours for the boys? Oh, I, I, and uh, girls. Of, of, of Philip Davis's uh, non-commitment, yeah, well, I, I guess that he's um, in a difficult place because he clearly can't justify it, can he? Um, and, and the reason I think this is important is that you know some people will be watching this thinking actually 
outside the Westminster bubble, who cares? But the thing is, we mustn't forget that when you become a member of the House of Lords, you become part of the legislature. So when it comes to actually approving laws that mm -hmm. the House of Commons has made, you are part of that process. That's why this is very, very important that it's constructed and organised and processed in the right way. Um, two things, if I may. Um, first of all, we shouldn't just feel or believe or perceive that this is a conservative thing. Um, we only have to look back to 2005-06 to see what happened did, under Tony Blair, and cash for peerages. Was being slightly hypocritical. Though, Lord Levy, police investigations into money allegedly having been given in exchange for peerages. That, I suspect, will happen again under the next government, uh, albeit a Labour one. I don't think it matters what your political colours are. What I get particularly frustrated about, though, is when it comes to civil servants and politicians that are simply doing the job that they've been employed to do, they become a Lord or a Sir, and I think that's absolutely abhorrent. I think the people in the honour system, or that should be the beneficiaries of the honour system, are ordinary people that put themselves out, work hard in their communities, do things for charity. It should not be for the head of the civil service to do a 20-year job on £200,000 a year and get an automatic knighthood at the end of it. I think it's absolutely outrageous. But, but Amy, everyone always comes up with argument. Give it to the lollipop lady. Give it to the, the, you know, the charity worker who's toiled, you know, thanklessly for years on end. But no one really can that doesn't give them the headlines does it that doesn't have the the glamour around it that you know giving gongs to politicians has it's funny though because i think a lot of people when they hear um things like oh you're going to have a knighthood or you're going to be put in the house of lords they do kind of imagine it's sort of a pride of britain awards type situation and it will genuinely be given to people who have earned it in that way in the charity sector for example um but i i think in the vt there was the man that said oh um they're like a bunch of bananas not a straight one amongst them and then i think unfortunately <laughs> philip davis made that demonstrably true in that interview by avoiding the question completely because we all know why he got it because he's one of the few MPs who's been loyal to Rishi Sunak. But he's not going to come on the show and say, yeah, I don't deserve it, is No, but he could say, well, I've been very loyal to Rishi Sunak and I think that's probably something... You know, what we all know to be true <laughs> rather than avoiding the question and taking the public for fools. Yeah, I, d I just can't get particularly outraged up about this because they've been doing it for years, as Russell quite eloquently made the point. But can, maybe when Labour comes in, maybe I'll get one because I give them, like, £5 a month for my membership. Well, the thing is, <laughs> this is the thing. Annalise Dodds this morning uh, was, was making the point that, you know, sort of like, you know, it's cronies, it's conservative cronyism, it's jobs for the boys and occasionally the girls. Um, so Labour obviously are going to get rid of it then. Well, uh, probably not. Um, you know, and, and also I, we should mention the Liberal Democrats as well. Remember them? Um, they famously no. took a load of money from someone called Brown. <laughs> Brown or whatever, who turned out to be a bit of a ne'er-do-well, and they refused to give the money back. So it is a plague on all political houses, frankly. Uh, this honour system is absolutely well and truly broken, has no credibility whatsoever. Right, should we squeeze in one more story? Ten years of same-sex marriage. Last year marked the tenth anniversary of same-sex marriage being legalised in England and Wales. And today is exactly a decade since the first weddings took place. Mm. Good thing, Amy. Well, this was David Cameron's best work, wasn't mm. it? He was a PM of equal marriage. Um, yeah, it, it's great to commemorate it, but I think it's also important to to draw upon the fact that still the Church of England will not legalise same-sex marriage and, and they will only bless same-sex weddings. So although um, we have... We, we're celebrating the 10 years of, of legal equal marriage. But we some, still some have... Christians don't believe in same-sex relationships. Well, that, then we still have progress so is, to make, is, don't we? is Russell, is nothing sacred. I, by the way, I fully support same-sex marriage. I, you know, absolutely, 100%. But when it comes to the church... Can we not just, well, you know... I, I think the hypocrisy here, Ben, is, uh, is palpable. On the basis that we have the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, preaching morality and wokeism to us on a daily basis. I mean, he uses every opportunity. Uh, and he wants to talk about the virtue of immigration and so on and so forth. Yet, when it comes to morals and wokeism, he won't ordain and sanction same-sex marriage. Mm. I mean, it seems rather hypocritical to me. It feels mm. like we're edging ever closer, though. Like now they're well, why going it to, so long? to bless why, the wedding. Why does it take so long? And, and actually, what's interesting is it was the Conservative government, as you rightly say, under David Cameron, that legalised this. Why didn't the Labour Party do it? And this is this is uh, in their kind of um, uh, their purview, isn't it? Mm, but then it was um, equally. Theresa May then came in and she believed that the Gender Recognition Act would be her same-sex marriage and have the same kind of um, same reception and be celebrated and look how that... I mean, the, the church has trans priests and trans vicars, so why wouldn't you uh, allow gay marriage in the church? Yes, yeah. It and, doesn't and make sense. There's a recent story this week, isn't there, where um, someone was uh, in trouble for causing a transgender priest. He 
when he should have been using the correct pronouns. Mm. Okay, okay, so uh, we move on. Now, your morning news with Sophia Wensler. Thanks, Dawn. It's 11.31. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB Newsroom. One of the Conservative Party's major donors has received a knighthood as part of a surprise honours list from Rishi Sunak. Mohammed Mansour gave £5 million to the Tories last year and is a senior treasurer for the party. He was knighted for what's described as services to business, charity and politics. The timing of the list is unusual, coming while Parliament is in recess and on the eve of the Easter Bank holiday weekend. A 19-year-old man has been charged with attempted murder and possession of an offensive weapon after a stabbing on a train on Wednesday. Rakeem Thomas has been remanded into custody. He would appear at Wimbledon Magistrates Court. Police said earlier that the alleged victim, who's in his 20s, was in a critical but stable condition in hospital. Documents have revealed that the post office was aware of errors in its Horizon IT system, despite bosses' proceedings with prosecution. More than 900 sub-postmasters were wrongly prosecuted due to supposed losses flagged by a faulty computer system. A spokesperson for the post office says it remains fully focused on supporting the inquiry. <coughs> and we're in for a blustery Easter weekend, with strong winds and even some flood warnings in place. Ferry operators are warning of possible disruption, with strong winds making for a choppy journey across the Channel. A yellow warning is in place across large parts of England throughout today, and the RAC is warning motorists to take care on the roads, with around 14 million car trips expected over the holiday. And for the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Right, there's a big episode of Patrick Christie's tonight hitting the airwaves, hitting your screens at 9pm. He's going to speak exclusively to former Immigration Minister Robert Jenrick about everything migration. Small boats, uh, the legal migration, a city the size of Birmingham every two years. Let's take a quick listen to what is in store tonight. Well, I didn't feel that the Prime Minister understood the importance of legal migration to the British public. It was an issue that I have cared about for a long time. I shared that conviction with Suella Braverman, the, the Home Secretary at the time. She and I met the Prime Minister approximately every fortnight to talk about Home Office issues, like stopping the boats, like security and policing. Never once did we have a conversation about legal migration because the Prime Minister didn't want to talk about it. Right, and that's uh, arguably, the, the legal migration is arguably a bigger problem than the small boats, which is, what, 45,000 a year. Yes, we don't know who they are. They throw their passports yeah, and mobiles but, into, into but the water. But three quarters of a million legal migration. Yeah. And, and what is the Prime Minister doing, right? It's obviously a huge concern to everybody in this country, migration, whether it's legal or illegal. What is the Prime Minister doing? Not talking about it. I don't get it. You mentioned it at the top of the show. You said... I mean, everyone can see what the Tories need to do, right, to win this election. Uh, they need to... Stop the boats, and I've argued for a long time, arguably, if that means copying Australia and turning them back, then do it. And also sort legal migration out and also um, deport people who have lost their asylum claims uh, and send them back to, to where, you know, they should be. That's a very simple three-point plan, which I've always said would probably do the Tories a massive favour towards winning the election, but they just don't get it. Instead, they carry on with Rwanda, which even Rishi Sunak, as we know when he was Chancellor, doesn't even think will work. Yeah, anyway, so Patrick's got that massive interview with Robert Jenrick tonight, 9pm, uh, and I'm going to take this opportunity to tease my own show. I'm covering for Mark Dolan between 8 and 9pm before Patrick as well, so tune in for that. For the meantime, you're with Britain's Newsroom on GB News. Stay with us. and Co. Weekdays from 6 p.m. Um, the Guardian's not happy, any, everybody, because uh, one of their headline stories today was about a private members club uh, that is for gentlemen only, the Garrick Club, I refer to, in London. Uh, there's accusations now, Quinton, that it's all the kind of upper echelons of society, all the, the powerful... It's a cabal elite. of important, powerful people who are running the country. And I thought to myself, <laughs> when I heard descriptions like that, I bet Quentin Letts is somehow involved. <laughs> Are you? I've been, I've been to the garage a few times. Why can't women be members? Because it's a gents' club. 
My, my daughter, my, one of my daughters, is a member of an all women's club called the University Women's Club, and uh, uh, they don't allow blokes in. It's an outrage. No, it's not. It's 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 a free country. I mean, it's archaic and it needs to change. What is? You know, is my view. The fact that the Garrick doesn't submit women members. There are lots of these members clubs, um, you know, across London, probably in other parts of the country as well, and, you know, you have to pay for membership, so it is well-to-do members of society that go. I've no, no, nothing against them existing, but all of them have changed their constitution. Those that were once men only, you know, they all now admit women. The only exception now is the Garrick. My other thought is, well, why are we genuinely, why are we talking about it if we've got nothing more important going on? Just to be frank, I genuinely could not care less uh, if there is a club that I'm not allowed into because of my sex. Um, I do, though, think that if you're going to start... You're allowed in, though. They let them in. Yeah, but not as members. Yeah. Um, but I do think if you're going to start, um, you know, having all of this kind of respect and all the rest of it for single sex spaces for men, then you can't, as a society, allow uh, the ridiculousness that goes on in female spaces when a man uh, sticks a dress on and a wig maybe and a bit of lipstick if he's feeling bold uh, and says that he's called Sharon and then wants to be allowed into that space and then those uh, establishments then buckle and let those men actually into things like changing rooms of women. That really, really annoys me. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Gloria DiPiero. This is GB News, Britain's election channel. It's 11.38 on Good Friday. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News with Ben Leo and Dawn Neeson. Good morning to you. Now, do not enter the water. That's what rowers from Oxford and Cambridge University have been told ahead of their boat race tomorrow after, and this is disgusting, E. coli was discovered in the River Thames at almost three times the recommended limit. Yes, it's the end of a nearly two-century-old tradition where the Victoria's crew members are dunked in the Thames and they throw the cocks in as well, which isn't a euphemism, but, yeah, they do. So there you go. <laughs> they can do it. OK, right. Joining us now is the lead campaigner, We Own It, John Bosco Naboro. Good morning, John. So, E. coli running rampant in the River Thames. Is this unusual? Is it record amounts of E. coli? Or does this tend to happen uh, uh, between various years? No, it's not um, usual at all. It's quite um, unique this year at the levels at which it is um, running. And um, the reason for this is obviously record levels of sewage being dumped into um, our river by um, Thames water. And of course, the problem affects other um, rivers and seas across the country um, uh, where other um, water companies are dumping sewage into the river as well. I was thinking this morning about whether or not this is this should continue to be called the boat race. Perhaps they should change the name to the floor is lava, uh -huh. where if you <laughs> step into the water, you might contract um, some kidney disease and sepsis. Um, and this is the cost of water privatization after 30 years. So, John Bosco, you've been complaining. You've been complaining and campaigning about this for a long while now. Why has nothing been done? Every year the situation has got worse. The government do nothing. Off what do nothing? What's going on? Well, it's. I think there there is um, an ideological obsession at the top of government with privatisation. Voters, the people listening to this call right now, including uh, a big majority of conservative voters, seven out of ten voters support taking our water fully into public ownership. And the reason for that is quite rational and straightforward. We are literally the only country in Europe that runs water in public hands. We are also the only country in the United Kingdom that runs water in, 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 in private hands. Scotland is publicly owned. In Wales, water is um, owned by a, a company that is owned by the government there. It makes no sense. This Thames Water, for example, has taken out 
around £7 billion pounds in dividends um, from the company since it was privatized. And guess who owns it? Um, when we're talking about um, owning water by ourselves, our water, Thames Water, is owned by Abu Dhabi, um, Kuwait, Ch the Chinese um, government huh. um, sovereign wealth fund. It's incredible. John, I, 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 I have been going on about this for weeks and weeks and weeks. I think it's absolutely disgusting what these water companies do. And it's a damning indictment on this country that we are literally pumping raw sewage into our rivers, our seas, our waterways. It's the stuff of the third world. They do that in Southeast Asia. They pump, um, you know, literal filth into their waterways, and we're doing it. And at the same time, as you said, paying these people, these shareholders, these private companies from abroad, billions and billions. Do other, any other Western countries, say in Europe, for example, do this? No. Um, I think that's a fairly simple um, question to answer. And even in the United States, where obviously a lot of people will think, well, that's the land of private, uh, private enterprise, 90% um, of the local authorities there, because their water is mainly run locally, 90% um, of the local authorities there run their water in public hands. It makes no sense to run something that is so fundamentally not market friendly. You don't have a choice. When you open your tap, you don't have a choice as to who is going to supply that water. There is no competition. You're not going to decide, all right, I'm mm. going to stop this month getting from Thames Water. I'm going to start getting from GB News Water, for example. Mm. Um, so it's quite important that we treat this as what it is, something that's there to serve the public good. And being run in public, in private hands, does not do that. And obviously, the evidence is staring us in the face right now. The boat race has essentially become the floor is lava. John Bosco, I mean, you, 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 I've had I've had E. coli infection, and it's really, really not pleasant at all. Thankfully, I wasn't as bad as some people get with it. I mean, do you think, you know, that the boat race maybe should not go ahead full stop? That the water is too polluted now? Well, I, I would not um, deign to suggest that it, it doesn't go ahead. It's a very long um, historic um, event. Um, I think that what should stop happening is um, our water being controlled by these companies who cannot get um, who cannot get their house in order. It shouldn't be run in this way. It, we should not allow ourselves to change our traditions, the traditions of people across this country, in order to fit a model of running water that is incredibly unique in the world and also that is not delivering the results that people want. And obviously, we're talking about the boat race today. But every single day, we're talking about families who go to hang out in the in the uh, at the rivers and lakes. Um, we're talking about um, we're talking about um, children um, in, on school trips who go to these rivers. So this is not just an issue that affects um, Oxford and Cambridge. It's an issue that affects families across this country, and we should not have to change because we want to accommodate um, profiteering private water companies. We should take these companies or this our water back into public ownership reinvest the profits. I just wanted to point out one thing. Scotland kept their water in public hands when ours was privatized. Over the period of the last 30 years or so when it's been privatized, they've managed to invest about 70 pounds more per year per household in Scotland than we have invested here in England. Their water is not perfect, but they've invested more because they have invested profits. John Bosco, one final very quick question. Would you go paddling in the Thames? I would not. I cannot <laughs> swim, unfortunately, so um, I, I would not get myself anywhere um, near a body of water where I could capsize. Interesting. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Have a good weekend, John. Uh, in response, so Thames much. Water have said, uh, we'd like to reassure our customers that despite this announcement, it's business as usual for Thames Water. Our 8,000 staff remain committed to working with our partners in the supply chain to provide our services for the benefit of our customers, communities and the environment. Business uh, as usual, they say. What does that mean? Mm. Pumping sewage into the water. Mm. Honestly, th there's not one single topic that gets me riled as much as this. A nation swimming in its own filth. I mean, th that's what it is. It's disgusting. It, it is disgusting. All, all while paying these people billions of pounds. I'm with, I'm with John Bosco on that. I wouldn't go in that water, I must admit. Right, up next, uh, your pint at the pub could soon be poured by a robot. Would you welcome that? You're with Britain's Newsroom on GB News. Hello there, welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast from the Met Office. Well, looking ahead to this Easter weekend, for many of us it's going to be a mixture of sunny spells and scattered showers. Low pressure is going to hang around, but it will be a little bit less unsettled than it has been. And with winds coming in from the south, it should just feel a little bit warmer.
So for the rest of Good Friday afternoon, a mixture of sunny spells and scattered showers. Some of the showers could be fairly heavy, could hear the odd rumble of thunder, with the best of the dry weather probably up across parts of northern Scotland. In any sunshine, it won't feel too bad. In the south, we'll see highs reaching around 14 or 15 degrees. So into this evening, for many western parts we continue to see some further showers, but out towards the east and eventually into central parts it will turn a little bit drier and clearer. Could you see a few misty patches come dawn and under the clear skies it will turn a little bit chilly. Could see a touch of ground frost as temperatures fall down to around 3 to 4 degrees. But for many central and eastern parts we will start Saturday with some sunshine. Just keeping an eye on this area of rain, it may just move into the far east of England for a time but for many of us it's going to be another day of sunny spells and scattered showers. Showers a bit fewer and further between compared to today and in any sunshine once again it will feel fairly pleasant. Temperatures in the north reaching around 11 to 10 degrees potentially 15 or 16 degrees in the south. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Hello, welcome back. Right, it's Good Friday, Easter weekend, so let's talk about beer, shall we? <laughs> Weatherspoon boss Tim Martin joked that there are robots pulling pints in his pubs as he was quizzed about artificial intelligence recently. So, Dawn, would you mind a robot serving you a pint in a pub? At what now, at this precise moment in time, it's a little bit early, but seeing as you're asking, uh, yes, I wouldn't mind at all, to be honest with you. However, I don't want to do bar people out of jobs either. And that is the problem here. Uh, joining us now is lawyer and artificial intelligence enthusiast, hey. Andrew Eborn, enthusiast. Um, Andrew, I, you, we've had this conversation a million times. We have. AI terrifies the life out of me, especially seeing as many of the jobs that are going to be lost to AI are disproportionately women's jobs. Um, absolutely. And I always say it's our greatest human achievement, but also potentially our biggest existential threat. And what you do, as you know, I talk around the world as a futurist advising companies about what's happening in technology and these seismic advances, advances there are so that people are prepared. But if you remember the jobs they had 40 years ago, about 60 per cent of those are no, are, are no longer in effect, but they've been replaced by other jobs, and that's what's going to happen. Uh, he was brilliant in his, his thing. He was talking about, actually about the coffee machine. And we have one here at GB News. You don't have a coffee maker doing that sort of stuff. You have a little wonderful machine. You press the button, it makes your coffee for you. It never works. Uh, well, we, well, I've had a fantastic coffee. It's one of the best coffee in broadcasting. I love it. Um, but what's going to happen? Every single job in the world will be affected by artificial intelligence. It's been around since the 50s and that sort of stuff. So if you're not aware of what it can achieve, uh, you're going to miss out. But as you said, I don't think this is just going to be an exodus, an exodus of jobs and that's it. Because when the internet came round, everyone was saying the same thing. Oh, my God, we're going to be out of our jobs, that, you know, yeah. robots and the internet's going to take everything over. As you've alluded to, it just creates opportunities for Absolutely. new jobs. Because we're going to be doing so many things that we can't even think of or envision right now. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Six percent of the jobs we have today weren't around 40 years ago. And you're going to see seismic changes in that sort of thing. The great thing about AI is that we're getting wonderful changes in things like medicine. We're finding cures for disease 
diseases and so on and so forth. In terms of jobs, it's also enhancing things. You have uh, like new forms of entertainment. You've got the ABBA, ABBAverse is happening at the moment on that sort of side as well. Frankly, I find that weird. The, 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 the thing is with AI, I get right, artificial intelligence is being invented by us. But yes. now we've invented AI that invents other AI. Yes. So we have no idea what the bots are doing talking to one another. Well, and that's the scary thing. We Possibly. do need... You, you might remember um, that we had a, the first World Safety Summit right here in the UK at Bletchley Park last year. And they all came in, Elon Musk, and I'm a musketeer, support everything he does, well, most of the things he does. Uh, you work on that sort of premise. Uh, the reality is that if we understand what it can do, then you make sure you have safeguards in place as well. And that's the reality. So auto, what it's going to do, lots of jobs, the boring, repetitive jobs, the manual jobs, the processing of huge amounts of data. It's much better with AI and it's going to make life much more efficient. Rishi, and that's the thing to look at. Rishi Sunak has been engineering the UK to become a world leader in AI innovation. Are we there? Are we a world oh, leader? Where does the UK sit? We totally punch above our weight. Really? We should absolutely... I campaigned to put the AI into Britain and see what I did there. Uh, you, you, work, you work on that sort of premise. So we are. We have some of the best brains in the world. We have some of the most creative things. The way to look at AI, and Rishi alluded to it uh, during the Safety Summit, is as a co-pilot. If you understand what it can do, then it's brilliant. I do this thing, as Dawn knows, called fake or fact, which we look at all the time. And if you combine AI, which was the word of the year last year, Colin's word of the year, with fake news, uh, which was 2017, the world is a polluted information age. What you need to do is to question everything. What, what do you reckon about getting AI robots to patrol the English Channel and stop the smoke? Yeah, they, they could do it. Like and, and actually, you're working on the sort of base. They could absolutely do that. And also, they can work out the likelihood of certain things happening. In the same way, they can predict criminality. They can predict certain things as well. So all of that is happening behind the scenes. They don't talk as much about it, but it is happening. But we don't have that. We, we, oh, I know we had the uh, conference of Bletchley Park, but we don't have security guards in place on this yet. Nowhere in the world does, do they? That's the problem. Well, they have these little guard dogs. I mean, you might have seen them. I, I, I go along to these lots of conferences, speak at these conferences around the world, and there are. There are robotic dogs that can sniff people out uh, and so on and so forth. There, there are effectively in place lots of these sort of systems. But it's not just the physical things. Obviously, they're working on uh, the cybercrime as well, working on the basis that you can predict these things by analysing wording and people's p and patterns of behaviour. I love your enthusiasm for it. I can see and feel your passion as you're speaking and it's so rare when you meet people um, and they're talking about a subject they're meant to be an expert at but you Andrew I can feel I can, it coming you're, 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 you're a convert now Ben yeah, thank you no he's not actually a bot I am a bot I am a bot that <laughs> enthusiasm isn't coming from a pre-programmed bot designed to sell AI to you it, it certainly is and I'm well spotted <laughs> it looks good well, I, I, it is a reality I just hope they don't uh, replace TV presenters that's all I'll say that's Sorry. it. Malfunction, malfunction. <laughs> <laughs> That's it from Britain's newsroom. I am back tonight. I'm going to plug myself now. I'm covering Mark Dolan's show, 8 to 9 p.m. Lots of fun coming up. Um, I'm going to have a special... Um, something to say about Christianity and Easter. And Dawn, you are... I'm going to be identifying as the lovely Michelle Dewey tonight as well. What so a it's treat. Double Ben and Dawn today. Sorry about that, and we're not bots either. <laughs> uh, as you can probably tell. Uh, Andrew, thank you very I'd much. I'd love to see you. Today. Uh, right, Britain's newsroom is up next. Next, um, a good afternoon, a Breton, with Patrick and Emily. Yes, well, three big political stories for us to go out today. The allegation is Rishi Sunak never cared about legal migration. The working class are deserting the Tories, and how long can Starmer stand by Rayner? And we're asking what should happen to parents with children who are appallingly behaved. This comes after a Milton Keynes shopping centre was stormed by hundreds of children, and there was a massive clash with security and the police. Should parents be held responsible? Should they be fined or even prosecuted? Let us know what you think yeah. um, coming up on the show. And is it OK for men to be allowed their own spaces? Feminists are up in arms about the Garrett Some Club. Some feminists. Some feminists. There we go. Anyway, all to play for. GB Views at GBNews.com. Let's hear from you. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast from the Met Office. Well, looking ahead to this Easter weekend, for many of us it's going to be a mixture of sunny spells and scattered showers. Low pressure is going to hang around, but it will be a little bit less unsettled than it has been. And with winds coming in from the south, it should just feel a little bit warmer.
So for the rest of Good Friday afternoon, a mixture of sunny spells and scattered showers. Some of the showers could be fairly heavy, could hear the odd rumble of thunder, with the best of the dry weather probably up across parts of northern Scotland. In any sunshine, it won't feel too bad. In the south, we'll see highs reaching around 14 or 15 degrees. So into this evening, for many western parts we continue to see some further showers, but out towards the east and eventually into central parts it will turn a little bit drier and clearer. Could you see a few misty patches come dawn and under the clear skies it will turn a little bit chilly. Could you see a touch of ground frost as temperatures fall down to around 3 to 4 degrees. But for many central and eastern parts we will start Saturday with some sunshine. Just keeping an eye on this area of rain, it may just move into the far east of England for a time but for many of us it's going to be another day of sunny spells and scattered showers. Showers a bit fewer and further between compared to today and in any sunshine once again it will feel fairly pleasant. Temperatures in the north reaching around 11 to 10 degrees potentially 15 or 16 degrees in the south. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Want to be a winner just like Phil? Obviously, whoever wins it next is going to be as happy as I was, and they're going to get even more money this time round, so why wouldn't you go in the draw? Enter our massive spring giveaway. There's £12,345 in tax free cash to give your finances a spring boost. We'll also send you on a shopping spree with £500 worth of vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. You'll also get a garden gadget package. You have to hurry as lines close at 5 pm on Friday. For another chance to win the voucher, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio,